What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 396. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources. And joining me on the line, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how are you, sir? Good, good. I'm ready to dive in for maybe two hours of devastation. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see how long it takes. This is a small set, one of the last small sets we get to do, but it is time for the Hour of Devastation set review show. This is the commons and uncommons set review. This is the gold standard in set reviews. I'm going to go ahead and say that. And uh, you're here... For audio set reviews at the very least. (laughs) You're here to get better. We know that. That's why you come listen to Limited Resources. And this is one way that you can get a big leg up on the competition when it comes to the pre-releases, releases, releases, and subsequent events that are coming your way with Hour of Devastation now in the mix. So we're going to go over every single common and uncommon from Hour of Devastation on this show in depth to give you an idea of which cards to go for and perhaps which ones to avoid. Before we get into it, our sponsor, ChannelFireball.com. They are a big part of what makes limited resources possible, and we want to thank them. And we encourage you to go check out their website. If you need anything magic-related, you are going to find it at ChannelFireball.com. Old cards, new cards, Stuff for your cube, stuff for, you know, your latest standard deck. It's all going to be there. If you need sealed products so that you can draft with your friends, if you want to pre-order and get Hour of Devastation the moment they're able to ship it to you, you can do that all at Channel Fireball. They'll send it in the mail and you'll have it before anybody else. Get your friends over to your house, do a booster draft, and you'll be on your way. You also will find some of the best content about magic in the world. You know, look, you come here to get better at magic. We know that. That's what we're here for is to help you do that. And you know what? You can do that on Channel Fireball as well. Some of the best players and content makers on the planet for our game work for Channel Fireball, and you can find their stuff each and every day absolutely free right on that front page. Please visit channelfireball.com. Also, thank you so much to all of our patrons. This is, of course, a way that you can support the show directly. Patreon.com slash limited resources. It's super easy to get set up. You can stop anytime you want. You set the limits. You set the amounts. It's all up to you. And it's just a way to give back to the content creators that help make your life a little better, add a little little joy to your life. And uh, if our podcast is one of those things, that's the place to go, patreon.com slash limited resources. Thank you so much to everybody who supports us there as well. We really, really appreciate it. Okay, it's time to get down to business here. The first things first, though, uh, we are going to be using a grading scale that we use here for the set reviews. And Luis, I wondered if you could uh, maybe break it down for people that hadn't heard it before. Sure thing. Uh, We're going to start with A's. So we're going to go an A through F scale. Uh, A's are the bombs. They're game winners. They're good in many situations, especially when behind. And these are the best cards in the set. These are your bomb rares and your hyper-efficient spells. So cards like Glorybringer, our Archfiend of Ifnir, Angel of Sanctions. I actually would have put Magma Spray in here at the end of the format as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cut to Ribbons comes to mind as another type of card like that. Just super efficient, you know? Uh, your Bs are cards that actively pull you towards their colors. Uh, they're headliners for a set, go-to cards, and reasons to be in a particular color, combination of colors, clan, guild, whatever. It's also where solid removal usually goes. Cards like On Crop Crasher, Cast Out, and Angler Drake. Mm-hmm. Your Cs are your playables. These are the pawns of limited. Uh, they're very interchangeable. Your, your deck's going to end up with a ton of Cs in it. And this is where you're just your average creatures, your your re, you know regular combat tricks, your normal removal spells fall into. So this is just where most cards fall into, somewhere between C minus and C plus. These are cards like Binding Mummy, Bitterblade Warrior, Minotaur, Sure Shot, and Shed Weakness. Then you have Ds. These are the sometimes playable cards that you know if they end up in your deck, you're not super happy about. These are your your mediocre combat trips tricks and your kind of maybe like high expensive removal spells. So. These are cards like uh, Miasmic Mummy, Supply Caravan, Giant Spider. And then you have Fs. These are unplayable cards. These are your your weird rares, your your car, your commons that just don't do anything. Your uh, Luxa River Shrines, Dispossesses, Hazaret's Favors. These are the, the cards that you really should never put in your deck. Then we have two more categories. We have uh, sideboards. So these are cards that basically never make the main deck, but once you board them in, well, they often tend to be quite good. So these are cards that are very situational in nature. Uh, cards like Dissenter's Deliverance, Blazing Volley. There's actually a cycle of uh, sideboard cards that are uncommons here that are quite good, uh, most mostly. So we'll, we'll talk about those when we get to them. And then lastly, we have Build Around. So these are cards that by themselves don't really do much, but can be great when combined with the right cards. So a card like Drake Haven or Sandworm Convergence, which gets its own build around grade, though it'll still fall on that scale. So Sandra Convergence and Drake Haven are cards that you can't just jam into a deck and expect good results, but 
in the right deck, they're great. And then when it comes to actually using the grading scale, you know, we, we, we do have kind of a word of warning for people uh, if, if it's your first time on, on one of our set reviews. That is that the grading scale we use is to put a punctuation on our comments. Uh, our comments really give you the most accurate view of a card. Not every card with the same grade is exactly equal, and there's a lot of context in them. We know a lot of people are just going to look at the grades, and we're saying you're going to miss out on a, a good amount of the value of the set review if you do that, though. They, they are a benchmark more than anything else. You really do want to hear what we have to say about at least some of the cards. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> All right, let's get into them. Uh, we've been doing something lately for sets like this, uh, traditional kind of two-color sets. They will often have a cycle of uncommons that will so sometimes, not always, but sometimes serve as kind of a signpost for what's to come from that color pair. And so we're going to do that this time again. We're going to start with the gold cards and see if we can't get a little bit of an idea going forward before we get into the actual colors about what it is that these color pairs are trying to do. Now, this one's set up a little differently than normal. There's five enemy color pair regular gold cards. Um, in this case, they're all creatures. And then the other five, uh, you know, friendly color pairs, they're actually aftermath cards. So it's a little different than normal, but let's let's get into it and we'll see what we can take out of it. So our first card, uh, I guess we're just going to do them all together anyway, right? So our first card is called Farm to Market. And it's it, ridiculous, name. which is an absurd. <laughs> I would not. It sounds it, like a restaurant David Ochoa would go to. <laughs> <laughs> I would not believe you if you told me that this is a real card and I hadn't seen it. I just feel like, come on, Luis, quit messing with me. Farm is uh, two and a white for an instant. Destroy target attacking or blocking creature. Reasonable start. Yeah, farm is a, is, a, is a card I would put in basically every white deck. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see what market does. It's it's two and a blue. This one's a sorcery. And remember, this is aftermath, so only from your graveyard. Uh, draw two cards, then discard two cards. It's upside. It lets you cycle away some lands or discard maybe a card with Eternalize later in the game. But yeah. this is one of the few uh, aftermath cards where I would just play it for the front half and not really care about the, the back half. Yeah, like, I agree. Th that, that's the key here. this in a white deck. Yeah, you just play it in a white deck. It, it, there's another common in this set that's similar to farm, and uh, and you're going to be playing that one too. So yeah, destroy target, attacking or blocking creature for two and a white's fine. And then the times when you cast market, it's probably pretty powerful, but you would never go for that effect just on its right. own. Yeah, I think farm to market gets a B. I'll just put it in my white decks and be happy with it. Yeah, I like B for farm to market also. Next card is called Consign to Oblivion. It's one and a blue for an instant. Return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. I generally like these type of effects, and I, and I find that they've gone up a bit in value uh, over the past few years as we've seen uh, the common removal spells tend to be slower. They cost four or five mana, uh, and sometimes they're not instant speed. This is a way that you can actually interact with an opposing creature for cheap, but it's not a high value card. This is, Consign isn't the type of card that you need to go out of your way for. So I kind of need something on the Oblivion side to really make me excited about this. Let's see what it does. It's four and a black for a sorcery, and it says target opponent discards two cards. Yeah, that's a pretty solid aftermath effect. I like since, that. I mean, the obvious combo is they have one card in their hand, you consign, bounce their creature, they have two, then you untap and oblivion them. Yeah, and it works because consign is an instant, so you can even set it up to do that uh, in one turn cycle, even if you've only got five lands total. I think given how good Winds of Rebuke was, and maybe things would be a little worse because there's uh, fewer cartouches, you know, auras running around. Mm-hmm. I think I would play Consign a good amount of the time, and if I was blue-black, I would always play this card. I think so, too. I think if you're blue-black, it's probably a B-minus or something around those that range. I mean, these are, you know, these are two cards that you, you, you know, occasionally play in your deck, a, a Mind Rot and a, and a Bounce spell. Putting them together is just very, very strong. So Even if you're paying a little bit more on the Mind Rot side. Exactly. But you're getting, uh, you know, straight value for Consign. Yeah. I mean, that's I would, what I would say B-minus B on Consign to Oblivion sounds yeah. good. I like it. Uh, what about Claim to Fame? What, what does this one do? Fame is one black mana sorcery. Uh, return target creature card with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard to your battlefield. Okay. Yeah, not great. No. Nope. Uh, just because often it'll miss. You just won't have a creature with cost two or less. And then Fame is one in a red sorcery. Uh, target creature gets plus two, plus one, and gains haste until end of turn. I'm not uh, a huge this, fan of this one. No, I think this card's got some pretty interesting modern applications with like Death Shadow, but Snapcaster oh, yeah. Mage, but th that's not oh, what we're God. talking about here. Wow, yeah. And uh, I, I think Claim to Fame is a card I'm generally going to pass on. You're just going to miss on the front half so often, and the back half isn't all that good. 
This looks like a D to me. Yeah, plus remember the card you're getting back in limited is often going to be like a two drop uh, common. You know, you're getting your two two for two with some upside or whatever. It's not really worth having a card that could be dead. So I like D for claim to fame also. Uh, struggle to survive. Two in a red struggle uh, for struggles. Two in a red instant struggle deals damage to target creature equal to the number of lands you control. Boom. That's awesome. Yeah, that I mean, that's a pretty big wow. game. Instant too. I would always play this card. Yeah, just, for just sure. Just a red kill target creature is really what it reads. That really so, is what it says. So that's uh, awesome. I'm, ar- I'm already in. Uh, I know. That's like a B on its like yes. surface. Unfortunately, it's, it's mostly on its own. Uh, survive. <laughs> it's one in a green sorcery. Uh, each player shuffles his or her graveyard into his or her library. So it makes eternalized cards a little worse. I, I don't know. It's, no, whatever. This uh, is just a mono red card. I'm and, ready to struggle. Yeah. So yeah, I, I like struggle with B. Yeah, the, the struggle is real. The survive is not so much. I like B for struggle. Yeah, that, that works for me. I'm not even acknowledging that survive is on the card at this point. Uh, this next one is called Appeal to Authority. Appeal is green for a sorcery. It says, until end of turn, target creature gains trample and gets plus X plus X, where X is the number of creatures you control. Which, really, we need to read authority here before you kind of judge it, because that's not super hot on its own. Authority says... Uh, is also a sorcery. It's one in a white, and it says tap up to two target creatures your opponents control. Creatures you control gain vigilance until end of turn. This is a kind of weird card. It's very aggressive. I mean, very. As a sorcery, you're really just using appeal to get a bunch of extra damage through. Mm-hmm. And authority basically does the same thing. So you combine them both. Your creatures all gain vigilance. You're getting like plus three, plus three on one of your creatures, and you're tapping two of their creatures. Mm-hmm. And, and your creatures seems- getting trample. That seems like a pretty good beatdown card. I think in green white so beats, I would always play this card. Yeah, this looks like a C plus to me. I would give appeal to authority a C plus. You ha- you need both halves and you need to be aggressive, but given those things, it looks well pretty appealing. I agree. I, I like C plus for appeal to authority. All right, now this brings us to uh, the the creatures. No more aftermath here for these uh, gold uncommons. Again, these the the aftermath ones. I don't know. It, I didn't really feel like I got a great idea of where they were going with the color pair you know I, like claim to fame consign to oblivion like bounce your thing make you discard like that's a strategy maybe i doubt it though but i think these cards uh will give us a, a, at least a little bit better of an idea and the first one certainly does it's called unraveling mummy and it's a one white black for a two three zombie and it has two activated abilities the first one is one in a white target attacking zombie gains lifelink until end of turn which is pretty good. But the second one's even better. It's uh, one in a black target attacking zombie gains death touch until end of turn. Yeah, this Ooh, is baby. quite good. Uh, the combination of the two abilities means your opponent can't profitably block. And when they do, you'll take out their creature. And then if they don't block you or if they do, you just give your zombie lifelink. So you, you win the race as well. It's also three mana, two, three, which is fine stats to begin with. Mm-hmm. And of course, I a relevant creature always- type play this card by itself and then it's great in a mummy deck which i think that lands on the pretty high high end of the scale for me i like a b plus on unraveling mummy i do too i think i think this is the type of card that's going to absolutely dominate in the right deck and it does remember to say attacking zombie it, it's not another attacking zombie so it can even a target itself and you know Luis, you and i like to talk about threat of activation on the show where you get benefits from the well, abilities you, you on your card would, yeah. it's true but uh you should talk about <laughs> yes. it more um, but yeah, it, the, the, you get the abilities on the card just as a threat. You don't even have to activate them a lot of times and you're going to get a lot of that from, from Unraveling Mummy. Really good card. Uh, Bloodwater Entity is one blue red for a 2-2 flying elemental. These are all in common, by the way. It's got prowess. So 2-2 flying prowess. Interesting. And then it says, uh, when Bloodwater Entity... Bloodwater Entity enters the battlefield, you may put target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard on top of your library. It's it's not Hmm. hard to damage, but it's making it so your next draw is something good. I mean, it's you may, so you don't have to, but if you've used a removal spell early, then this lets you rebuy it for later. And and the the question is just simply, if I have a card in my graveyard that I could target, you say, well, would I be happy if I drew that next turn? Then, yeah, then put it on top, and if not, then, then, then don't. It's also a 2-2 prowess flyer for three mana. Is that so, good? I, I can never really figure out how often yeah, that, I can that, realistically I think, trigger prowess. You I know? think that's good in a blue red deck, especially a spell heavy blue red deck. This is just attack for three a lot of the time or, or be a pretty threatening blocker. 
Okay. I mean, this is no Enigma Drake. I think that card is generally better, but okay. this is still pretty good in the blue red spells deck. I, I don't think it's insane. My guess is this lands. I, I would give Bloodwater Entity a C plus. I think. I think so too. Like Prowess, I think is usually a little overrated in limited. It's actually not that often that you can trigger it like multiple times in a turn or or multiple times throughout the game. You know, usually you'll have somewhere around seven or eight spells total in your deck that trigger it. So it's not you know the type of thing where it's just always a three three flyer, but. Uh, it, this has just enough going on, I think. And also, you know, you could do worse than a 2-2 two, two flyer for, for three mana. Like, that is not, you know, prohibitively bad. It's just merely kind of bad. Um, so C-plus for Bloodwater Entity. Boy, this next card's a real doozy. Uh, Obelisk Spider is one green black for a 1-4 with reach. And it yep. says, whenever the spider deals combat damage to a creature, put a minus one, minus one counter on that creature. And of note here, it it it's doing both. Like it takes yes. one and it gets the counter, unlike uh, some so previous this kills mechanics. two toughness creatures. Right, and then it also has another ability. Whenever you put one or more minus one minus one counters on a creature, and I have to note here that doesn't mean from the spider. It just means whenever you do that just in general. Yeah, and it can be your creatures or theirs. Each opponent loses a life and you gain a life. Yeah, this card is fantastic. Whew. It's. Really annoying to attack into. At the very least, it's draining them for one and putting a counter on their creature. It, it even could have just attack your opponent. They can't really do a whole lot about it. And it combines really well with just like the other random minus one, minus one counters that are floating around. So you don't need anything to put this card in your deck besides the ability to cast it. I think but I'm once you're building around it, uh, it becomes awesome. I would give Obla Spider a B plus. I think so too. The, the thing is that like every little corner case where you're like oh but does you're like yes the only thing it doesn't do that you'd want is to drain them for how many counters you put on and it just says whenever you put one or more so it's just for each instance but still whatever obelisk spider is awesome man that's a lot of power on a three drop uh next is is, is another pretty powerful card it's called resolute survivors it's one red white for a three three human warrior and it says you may exert it as it attacks does that sound familiar whenever you exert a creature Resolute Survivors deals one damage to each opponent and you gain a life. So you're draining your opponent for one, similar to what we just saw on the spider there, uh, whenever you exert anything uh, it's on your weird side. weird text on a red-white card. Uh, isn't that weird? Drain them for – like how is black not involved in this transaction yeah, on some I, level? I don't know, but what I do know is all the cards that say when you exert a creature ended up being really powerful because you'd often – play them, get a trigger that turn from your other exert creature, and then mm -hmm. threaten to get one or two triggers on your next turn. Mm -hmm. so you know, it is funny. It's awesome. You know, putting this right next to the spider, it is interesting, Luis, because it does actually say it deals one damage to each opponent and you gain one life as opposed to the spider, which is life loss. So this really is just the red is the damage and the white is a life gain. Uh, it's, you know, a mini lightning helix yeah, or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I guess still, lightning helix still, weird. but... Yeah. The combination makes me think of black cards. It does me. It does for me too. Uh, how good is this card? I mean, it's a three three for three in a presumably beat down color pair that once again is looks like it's telling us, hey, let's exert, let's attack, let's get in there, and it's helping us race and get my opponent dead. And it works for you know you could have a turn where you exerted three creatures at once and then they're drained for three. I mean, that's just going to add up a lot on a this on a fantastic. body that's it's great. It's also yeah. a three mana three three. Yeah, it's really just, good. It's three mana three three with just. Very high upside. I think this is a B plus also, but honestly, looking back, I wouldn't even be surprised if Resolute Survivors and Obelisk Spider both like edged into the A minus territory. But I'm going to give Resolute Survivors a B plus. As I like well. B plus as well. I mean, it's, we are just talking about hyper efficient cards here. They could they could edge their way up uh, all the way to the top. It's really going to depend on if their archetypes end up being good. That that's the question. So we'll keep an eye on that. Yeah, uh, that, that that's what'll get them to A minus. But you mm -hmm. could say that. Ne you could take a look at these cards, say that you never get to put them in a deck with other minus one, minus one counters or exert cards, and they'd still be a B plus. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> is that's that. a good place to be. Yeah. All right. Best for last. Yep. Okay. River Hoopo? Hoopoo. Hoopoo? Yeah. That's how it's pronounced. I'm not kidding. I looked it up. <laughs> it's a real I'm bird, too. The arbiter of the pronunciation guide. Sure. Uh, River Hoopoo. I looked it up, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's blue green so two mana one blue mana one green mana for oh, yeah. a one three bird with flying oh right. yeah two mana one three flyer dece i'm in here's here here's the payoff the 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 meat if you will three blue green you gain two life and draw a card so it's activated ability pay five mana yes. gain two life and draw one. i'm in love yeah. 
you know, every card here except Bloodwater Entity is fantastic, and uh, River Hoopoo is is really no exception. It's a two mana one three flyer, which is decent stats. Like you'll play that card mm-hmm. a lot of the time. Yep. And five mana to gain two and draw a card. The, the two life actually pretty important because it keeps you from falling behind while you're drawing cards. Yeah. Ooh, I I, love I think it. this card's not not an A either. I mean, no, this is, it, still, it, this is it, still a B plus, but. I would be really happy to first pick a gold uncommon here. I would too. And I just, this is a f- easy front runner for my favorite card in the set early here, the, the River Hoop. There's not some stupid bounce cards later, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this one could beat one of those. Let's just put it that way. I, I, I oh, yeah. love this type of card. So the card is great. Yeah, B plus for the River Hoop. Okay, uh, I think we're on red. Is that right? We are. Okay, so we're going to uh, jump over to red as we work our way through the colors here. Uh, more normally and we're going to go through the comments and comments together like we've been doing so our first call it card is a doozy it's called a braid it's a uh, one in a red for an instant at uncommon and it's modal you get to choose one uh, a braid deals three damage to target creature that's right one in a red instant deals three damage to target creature so i really don't need to read anything else uh, to make this card great but it does have another mode which is destroy target artifact so you really didn't read much more because yeah, that's like target not artifact doesn't tough. really come up in this format, right? I I do have one question though: Is destroy target artifact in red's color pie? Yeah. Okay, and so is dealing three damage. So this doesn't doesn't break the color pie. No. Okay, I just want to. It's make, fine. Make what do you mean? <laughs> so it's like it's like killing flyers, which is also like fine. Anyway. Whatever. <laughs> this is a braid is completely within pie, and it's awesome. All right, a braid a braid is a B plus. Yeah, I, I think. It's yeah. just not, you know, when I say Magma Spray is an A, that's just because that p- particular format ended up being insanely slanted towards the one and two drops. Uh, there are some formats where a braid could sneak up to A minus just because it's that efficient, but I, I would start a braid at B plus. I would too. And, and, and it's just a pure, an artifact. Why yeah, not? And, and if, if, yeah, if they have an artifact creature or something that, that we don't know about, then sure. But whatever, this is just hyper efficient removal. When we were talking on the grading scale about what what makes it into the B range, that's one of the types of cards that can do it and, and a braid is that. Uh, next is is much less efficient though the same cost it's called blur of blades and it's uh, one in a red for an instant this one's common so this one says put a minus one minus one uh, counter on target creature and blur of blades deals two damage to that creature's controller this is fine you don't want too many one tough one toughness punishing effects because you're just playing against someone with all two twos but this does kill a one toughness creature and pings your opponent for two. Also has some random little synergies here and there. Yeah, it also can shrink down a. Uh, you yeah, know, if there are three three blocks, you're three three. You get to win the combat. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not imp- that impressed with this. I think I would give Blur of Blades a C minus. Uh, yeah, that seems right for Blur of Blades. Also, I want to take a note here as we work our way through, Luis. This is this card has incidental damage on it. Okay. Yes. Uh, there's a lot sort of, of like two. There's a lot. Yeah. A lot and, of pings kind of running around here. Yeah, and I think that's going to help sort of shape some of the things that we need to consider in the early parts of the format. So I just want to just keep a little tally going on cards that do that. Uh, let's move on to Burning Fist Minotaur, which is an uncommon. It's one in a red. This is a good card too. Uh, it's one in a red for a two-one Minotaur Wizard with first strike. So a two-one uh, first striker for two is already pretty decent. But it's got, again, the threat of activation stuff's really coming up a lot. You can pay one in a red and discard a card to give it plus two, plus zero until end of turn. And of course, you know, the the, the obvious scenario is you've got your two, four blocker or your three, three blocker, and they go attack you with Burning Fist Minotaur. And you're like, crap. Like, if I block and they pay one in a red and discard a card, I just lose my creature outright. And if I don't, I'm taking at least two, but I might take more if they decide that they, you know, don't need the cards in hand or if that's, you know, within their game plan. Those are really powerful options for for uh, the, the player who controls the Burning Fist Minotaur. Yeah, I, I, I think that the combination of being an efficient body to begin with, you'd always play one in a red, two on first strike, and having a powerful activated ability makes Burning Fist Minotaur a pretty solid B. I think it's just a rock solid B also. I Yeah, I think that card's really good. Um, Chandra's defeat. Now I want you to read this one and you, you mentioned, uh, yeah, the cycle part of, of a cards cycle. here. Uh, there's yeah. five defeats, one for each, uh, planeswalker. It's one red mana. So one mana instant at, at uncommon Chandra's defeat deals five damage target red creature or red planeswalker. If that permanent is a Chandra planeswalker, you may discard a card. If you do draw a card, you can ignore all that text. Uh, that doesn't really matter. 
basically what matters is this is one red mana to deal five damage to a red creature at instant speed. So yeah. not a card I'm going to main deck, but an excellent sideboard card. Yeah, sideboard A. And so clearly on the sideboard category and an A in the sideboard. Like basically I would take this over most like C to C plus range cards because when you side it in, it is an A. And that even an A, like 40%, if, if all the colors are distributed evenly and everyone's playing two colors, an A 40% of the time is a really good card. So, but you would not main deck this, right? I would not main deck it. The only time I would main deck one of these is if like it turns out that in sealed, like 60% of people play a certain color, mm-hmm. then, then you might be able to. But And maybe if you had a discard outlet of some sort or something exactly, to, to turn it into a card. Otherwise, or, I, yeah, I'm happy picking up the defeats. Uh, for the most part, we'll, we'll get to each one individually. Yeah. But I, I like Chandra's defeat at sideboard A. Same. It's just too powerful. One mana, come on. Uh, crash. Of one mana, yeah. Yeah, crash, crash through. through mm-hmm. is what is this one? Red. Do? For a sorcery, mm-hmm. creatures you control gain trample until end of turn. Draw a card at common. Oh, this is just filler. We These had uh, cards. I always think sure, and then I never end up playing. Yeah, what was the renegade tactics? Yeah. Red target yep. creature can't block draw a card. That's much better than this card, right? And, and I still never end never up playing, playing that. So yeah, it's weird. My guess is crash through ends up being like a D. You can't go too wrong by playing it because it cycles. You're just not going to make it into your deck very often. Yeah, I think that really just speaks to the relative power level of the commons and uncommons in sets now. Like you just, this type of card just doesn't make it where you'd think there'd be a significant number of times where you're like, well, I'm a little short on playables. I'll play a crash through, no big deal. But it just doesn't happen as often as you'd think. Defiant Kenra is a pretty easy one. That's our next card. It's one and a red for a 2-2. It's a Jackal Warrior. My assumption is that this is not a card that you'll play that often, though if we contrast it, with Amonkhet, where you were often desperate for two drops, I could see Defiant Kenra making it, uh, you know, more often than you might assume, because generally speaking, a vanilla 2-2 two, two for two is a little below the bar for what you'd want, um, you know, in a, in a in a limited set these days. I mean, the 2-2s two for two tend to get a pretty nice bonus. Um, like I said, though, if you're an aggressive deck and you're short on twos, you'll probably end up running Defiant Kenra and being like, sure. Yeah, I am not excited about this card. You'd have to be pretty yeah. strange to be excited about this. I'm assuming but, it's uh, a D. It looks like a, yeah, I would say D plus on Defiant sure. Kenra. Sure. I mean, it's not uh, a card that, it's not like it's a card you can't put in your deck. It's just, no, like certainly you said, not. you're not excited about it. I am excited about this next one. Yeah, uh, the card's good. Fervent Paincaster says two in red for a 3-1 human wizard at uncommon. Tap Fervent Paincaster deals one damage to target player. Tap Exert Fervent Paincaster, it deals one damage to target creature. So... Three minute three one. It's it's a nettle drone, right? Already that just mm-hmm. sits there. Three minute three one that pings your opponent, and you can exert it to deal one to a creature. This card is excellent. It's just it's got high power, so it can randomly attack if your opponent doesn't have blockers. It can just sit there ping them, and then if they play a one toughness creature or you have a two two and they have a three three, you get to just ping for one if you need to. So, I mean, this card's really annoying to play against. It's another one of those cards that that you know gives red the ability to to kill you from you know a relatively low life total yeah you stabilize and then they play this and you're at seven it's like well you don't have that many turns right blur of blades Um, fervent pain caster you know these are the type of cards fervent pain caster a b i think it's a b as well i i I like that they've nerfed pinging creatures enough now that you know you really have to pay a lot to to make it happen but it still exists i think this is a good middle ground for that uh hey speaking of incidental damage here's another one firebrand archer one or red for a human archer at common, it's a 2-1, and it says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, Firebrand Archer deals one damage to each opponent. She's no Thermal Alchemist, but this is not too bad. Two mana, 2-1 two beater that maybe picks up three or four damage over the course of a game. It's reasonable. It's nothing I'm going to be excited about. Also, two mana, 2-1s two are not really where like the spell-heavy decks end up really wanting to put their, their creature stats, but... Like I said, free damage is free damage. Yeah. So I, think- I also just appreciate that this card is not completely dead late. Normally a 2-1 yeah. for 2 would just be abominable, you know, past turn 5 or whatever. And here, like, this is actually a card that could be annoying potentially, like in a blue-red deck. Yeah, I like Firebrand Archer. I would I would, say I would still just C. give it a give it a C, but Same, I think yeah. it's it's a playable one. Yeah. And by the way, that's another incidental de- like I I think that if you're playing a control deck that can't gain life, <laughs> don't think that you're stable at 5 because there's yeah. cards like this next one and the ones that we've seen already that have ways to get you dead uh, even if you've got a stable board state like Frontline Devastator is 3 and a red for a 3/3 three, three zombie minotaur warrior at common. It's got 
That's right, our first instance of afflict. This is afflict two. Afflict says whenever this creature becomes blocked, defending player loses, in this case, two life, whatever that number is. Uh, and then also, this one uh, has an incentive built in <laughs> to, to disincentivize your opponent from blocking uh, or from letting them through, which is one in a red, it gets plus one plus so until end of turn. So this is a four mana three three that pumps its power, and then if they block it, they also lose two life. That is reasonable. It's also a zombie. It's the only red common or uncommon zombie uh, yeah. besides was one uncommon as well. Yeah, I looked uh, into that. I, I haven't really found a way to abuse that. I don't think that's going to no, come up I think what will happen is if you're black, red, or red, white, you might have like a random synergy or two. Right. But I but think Frontline this Devastator is just a solid little zone. card, right? Yeah. This, yeah. Looks, this looks like a C plus to me. Like it's a four drop. You don't need, you can't play a ton of them, but it hits pretty hard. And if your opponent's at four and you play this, like they're like, well, I'm going to take a couple damage at the very least. And if you can like make it survive combat with a trick, it stacks pretty nicely. So yeah, you could just kill them. I would give Frontline Devastator a C plus. I like C plus for Frontline Devastator. Good solid common. Gilded Ceradon is our next card. It's got a little more work to do. It's a four and a red for a four four beast with a golden mohawk. A flowing golden mohawk. It says whenever it attacks, if you control a desert or there is a desert card in your graveyard, which, by the way, is a theme that you'll see come up over and over again for this set, uh, it says target creature can't block this turn. So a 4-4 four, for four, 5 that has the sometimes ability to make it so that a creature can't block when it attacks is pretty strong. I mean, that that's a nice card. The thing that I always see uh, for these red 5 drops, though, is that it ends up being a, a bit of a crowded spot. And it, and and sometimes uh, the cards need to be quite strong to really hold their own there. And this one seems kind of in the middle for me. Basically, if you never are going to have deserts, this card is not a card I'd be interested in playing at all. And if you always had a desert, this card would be excellent because... It's a great finisher. It's really hard to block a 4-4 under normal circumstances. And when you're removing their best blocker, that make, makes them have to work pretty hard to do that, especially since it just you know combines well with other attackers as well. I don't know how easy it is to, going to be to get a desert. And a lot of the deserts I've seen aren't all that appealing. I mean, some of the some of the, like the cycling ones seem fine, but a lot of the colorless ones don't seem like cards I'd normally want in my deck. So... My guess is Gilded Ceradon ends up being fairly replaceable, and if you want it, it's kind of rare that other people are going to want it too. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a control card either. It, it is an aggressive no, card. It is. And and like we said, you know, the, the five mana slot tends to be pretty crowded anyway uh, in these decks. There's uncommons and rares that will fight for that spot. So you're only going to run, you know, between one and three of, of these type of cards anyway, and so this one's not always going to be it. It's probably just like a C, though. I mean, if you do have a desert, it's a solid playable. Yeah, I would give Gilded Ceradon a C. Next is called Granitic Titan. It's four uh, red red for a 5-4 elemental at common with menace. So six mana, 5-4 menace, but it also has cycling for two mana. I like this more than Desert Ceradon. That was the 6-4 cycling for one red that mm -hmm. we saw in the last set. Just because a 5-4 menace is significantly better than a 6-4. One of the problems with a 6-4 is it just gets blocked too easily. And cycling two is a lot worse than cycling for just a red, but it's still, I think that the, the creature you're getting here is, is good enough that I think I would play Granitic Titan more often than not, though I would still just give it a C. I, yeah, I, I, my guess is that it's going to end up being a C or a C minus. Um, yeah, it's hard for this to, to, to reach higher than that. Right. This next card I think is one of the really interesting ones, and it kind of harkens back to uh, a, an issue that we talked about a lot for Amonkhet. It's called Inferno Jet. It's five and a red for a sorcery at uncommon, and it does six damage to target opponent. But it also has cycling for two. So is this, this is the exact a, kind of card you want with cycling. It is. Like this is the, the same thing that we went through before where it's like this high risk, potentially high reward card that just gets kind of undercut by cycling because it's like, you know, again, you, you don't, you're just losing most of the risk of running, you know, we call this a lava axe, right? The type of card that only can do damage to the opponent. So if you find yourself in a scenario where you're uh, behind or even at parity, a lava axe usually isn't what you want. In fact, it usually is, doesn't affect the board and, and doesn't do much at all. And so it ends up being kind of a blank. But if you're ahead or if you got out to a quick start, a lava axe can be exactly what you want because if your opponent stabilized their board and you can't really get through with creatures, that gives you a way to win the game. Normally, there's a lot of tension on whether you want to put one of those in your deck because you'll know, hey, I'm trying to be as aggressive as I can and I really need a finishing card to, to finish off my opponent, so I'll play a lava axe. With cards like this one, Inferno Jet, 
you know, this just puts cycling on it. So it just takes away that tension. And the questions just become, well, can I afford to have a, a card with cycling in my deck? Uh, you know, that, that some percentage of the time I'm going to need to cycle. And, and the answer is probably. And for an effect this strong, I think the answer is just yes. Like, if you're an aggressive deck, this is so much damage, right? Like, this is flood protection on two different levels. And six is a lot of damage to do to your opponent. I am actually pretty happy this card's uncommon. I thought it was common at first because this is going to end a lot of games. Oh, yeah. It is it is a Law of Axe that you get to put in any aggressive or I think mid-range deck just because you can steal games out of nowhere. Your opponent's at eight. You just like throw away two creatures to deal two and then just Inferno Jet your opponent out. Totally. And, or, or attack you with my Afflict creature or whatever. Right. You know? So yeah. cycling really, really powerful on this. It makes it – it lets you main deck a card that is a little too situational in most for most decks. So – I don't like the fact that I'm going to get Inferno Jetted a lot, but I, I do have to give the card, I think, a C plus. I do, too. I, I really don't like the design, uh, the, the, that concept still in place for me. But as a card, as a, as a tool that we're going to use to win games, I'm with you. C plus for Inferno Jet. Next is uh, Kenra Scrapper. A really solid little common here, I think. It's a it's two and a red for a Jackal Warrior that's a 2-3. So a 2-3 for three mana, and it has Menace. It just always has Menace, which is pretty good. Uh, you know, you'd prefer maybe the... Power to be three or something and the toughness to be two. But hey, it's a menace card. And it's got exert. If you exert it when it attacks, you can give it plus two, plus oh until end of turn. So it can smash for four with menace. Or it can just ch keep chipping in for two with menace, uh, you know, until you kind of need to uh, exert it. And I think that uh, overall is a pretty good little package. Looks like it's a cut above most red three drops uh, just because... Yeah, it can just get in for two a lot, and then when it looks like they might be able to block it, just exert it and get him for four. Yeah, yeah, I like uh, it. I think it's good. I mean, it's, I think it's a C plus. Like, I just yeah, think I like it's a, a solid Kendra playable. C plus. Yeah, uh, Kindled Fury. This is a reprint. Uh, <laughs> it's a uh, red for an instant common. It says target creature gets plus one plus zero oh, and gains first strike until end of turn. Uh pretty run of the mill combat trick. Yeah. There's not tons of great blocks to begin with in, a, in this set or this block, it seems like. So you're not going to use it maybe as often as you might think. But I think I would probably give it a C-. minus. I think so, too. I, these cards are just whatever. Uh, I do like the fact that it's only one mana. And if the format proves to be as quick as it was with Amonkhet, then having one mana spells that not only affect uh, the game but affect combat specifically can be quite good. Uh, next one is an uncommon called Magmaroth. It's a three and a red for a five, five elemental. So obviously that crushes the vanilla test. You don't normally get five fives for four mana. Usually you get a three, three. It says at the beginning of your upkeep, you put a minus one, minus one counter on it. So it blocks as a five, five. And then on your turn, it's effectively a four, four. And it says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you remove a counter, a minus one, minus one counter from it. What a weird card. Yeah, it's a kind of blue-red spells matter type of card. You, I don't think you'd want to put this in your deck unless you had a, a seven or more non-creature spells, it seems like. Okay. Because you, you do want to be able to take the counters off of it. But if you can play a spell, like, you really want to play a spell every turn. But playing a spell every other turn isn't that bad either. So I think the card is fine. It's it's not a huge incentive to play this deck, but you would put it in, put it in that deck and it would be good in that deck. Pretty annoying for your opponent too, right? Like you untap it to four four, you go attack, and they're like, uh They just have to treat it as a five five, I think. Right. I think so too. Yeah, that makes me want to give Magmaroth a a, a kind of reasonable grade. Like I, I I think it's a C plus. I think so too. And it might be a B minus, and I'm sure in certain decks it'll end up being a B. You know, like that if you yeah, can just, just keep the counters. It's just off. a four mana five five. Yeah, that's, that's pretty insane. Be. Right. Uh what does Manticore Eternal do? This is three red red for a 5-4 zombie manticore at uncommon. Mm. It has afflict three and three. attacks each combat if able. So five mana, five, four, but if they block it, they lose three life. I think and you just want to, to attack, attack with it anyway, right? I mean. Yeah, a five, four, the, the attack each turn if able uh, text is not a huge drawback on a five, four because those can get in fairly well. They're not chump attacking very often. Yeah. Well, the fact that they punishes them when they block and, well, punishes them if they don't block this makes this a pretty solid package. This is a five drop I'd be happy to put in my deck. I, I would give Manticore Eternal a C plus. Yeah, I think it might end up being a B minus. I think the uh, average use case for Manticore Eternal is you play it, your opponent leaves back some number of blockers, you send it in because you have to, they block, they trade off a, a reasonable, a three or four mana creature for it or two small creatures for it, and they take three in the process and you're pretty happy with that transaction. 
So. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like AC plus or B minus. Yeah, I mean, obviously the downside does pop up if you're behind in the game, but you can block for yeah, a turn. If your luck total is too low, then this this actually does matter. But right. for the most part, you're happy attacking. Yeah. Uh, next one's called Open Fire. If you've ever heard of the card Lightning Bolt, this is a lightning bolt, except for it costs two and a red instead of just single red. So two and red instant, it does three damage to target creature or player. I awesome. have trouble giving this less than a B. Yeah, definitely. Because yeah. You're going to pay three mana. You're going to kill what you need to. And sometimes you're going to kill your opponent. Yeah. I'm loving it. I mean, this is the type of card that, you know, is going to dictate a lot of what happens in booster draft because a lot of people are. You hope to open fire in a pack? (laughs) You missed a word. (laughs) I I like B for open fire. Uh, This next one's a little more interesting uh, because we haven't seen it before uh, a card quite like this. It's called Puncturing Blow. Two red red sorcery at common. It deals five damage to target creature, and if it would die this turn, exile it instead. So it's like a huge magma spray. Yeah, four mana for five damage at sorcery speed, I think is fine. It's fine, and, right? And like it's exiling not exciling. Exiling stops eternalized shenanigans. So this isn't something I'm getting excited about, but honestly, this is one of the better red comments. Not as good as open fire, but might be second after that. Yeah. So uh, I think I would give it a C plus. Yeah, I think so too. Puncturing Blow is a type of removal that we've come accustomed to. You know, yeah. slower, more expensive removal. Uh, <laughs> this next card's a beating. It's called Sand Strangler. It's three and a red for a 3-3 three, three beast at Uncommon. When it enters a battlefield, if you control a desert or there's one in your graveyard, you may have Sand Strangler deal three damage to target creature. Oof. It's a beating. This card's great. Uh it is a, the first card I've seen which gives you like heavy incentive to to search for deserts. Like Guild mm-hmm. of Ceridon, you'll play if you have deserts, but you're not like, I'm going to draft the desert deck. If you open Sandstringer, I think you take it, and I think you just try to pick up like two or three deserts because the payoff is just so high, and the fail case, not too bad, four mana, three, three. Yeah, I love the so, card. I think it's a B plus. Yeah, I'd give Sandstringer a B plus. Yeah. Uh, a couple more red cards here. Uh, Thorned Moloch is the first one. It's a two and a red for a 2-2 lizard with prowess. And uh, it has first strike as long as it's attacking. Yeah, this is an interesting one. Yeah. I don't know what deck really wants Thorned Moloch, I guess. I just Blue blue red is what comes to but mind. Blue red is a, wants creatures. It wants its threats to be able to block as well. It's not usually like super aggressive. And this is fairly aggressive of a card. Quite aggressive, yeah. It's only getting yeah. the first strike. Otherwise, you're looking at a 2-2 two, two for 3. But that's yeah. sometimes it's bigger if you have instant speed effects it's, or cards. It's it's That's pretty bad. Like you would be yeah. really sad with a 2-mana th- 3-3, three, three, you know, just in general. So I, I'm going to give Thorn Moloch, a, I think, a C-. minus. Yeah, I think so too. It might even be a D plus depending. Red looks aggro, man. Yeah, a lot of a lot of removal spells, uh, a lot of damaging, yeah. Yeah. a lot of just pinging the opponent. A lot of uh, encouraged attacks as well, you know. Oh yeah, and sometimes even forced in the ca- case of Manticore Eternal. Okay, uh, green, first card up, maybe the best card, uh, the best common for green. It's I called. I would assume so. Yeah, it's called Ambuscade. It's a uh, two and a green for an instant. Like I said, it's a calm, and, and it's, uh, it says target creature you control gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature and opponent controls. Uh, as you know, you will hear us say every time these cards come up, it's not a fight. It's just your creature punching theirs. Yep. And so three mana instant speed and an additional point of power on top of things. Yeah, this just looks like a B. Me too. I, I Instant speed is just so good for this. And the tempo that you get even off of the plus one, plus oh. Uh, it's a huge difference uh, to be able to punch something up a little bit from where that creature's at and then be able to attack with no damage on it whatsoever. Uh, it's a type of card that you'll often main face, even though you can do it at instant speed if you need to. I, I think Ambuscade's a B. Uh, next is called Beneath the Sands. It's two and a green for a sorcery. Search your library for a basic land card. Put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. Uh, and then it's also got Cycling for two mana. I'm not that impressed with this card. Like, yeah. I get that you can cast it if it's good or cycle it, but it's kind of slow to cast. Three mana ramp is just not what I'm in for. Right. And same cycling, thing that we just said about the average yeah. claimer. Yeah. And cycling two is just okay, a little slow. I, I I think that a three color ramp deck will want beneath the sands, but it's just fairly unimpressive outside of that. I can't really imagine playing this in a two color deck. I agree. So, yeah. Uh, I would give beneath the sands like a D plus. Yeah, I give it a D. It's just like you'll know when you want it. Now this next card, how is this a common? Uh, it's called Bitter Bow Sharpshooters. 
It's four and a green for a four, four Jackal Archer with vigilance and reach. This is a Sentinel Spider. Come yeah, back. Yeah, it's even easier to cast. I mean, this card's just great. Yeah, it's a good one. This is a good five drop. It, it, it does stabilize the board, lets you whack your opponent while still keeping a blocker back. A I'm not going nuts blocker. over this card. I, I mean, I still think this is just a C plus. I, I don't think it's into the B territory. I'm going to give it a B minus. All right. I, I think the combination of vigilance and reach on such a big body just makes it so much more likely to be able to get in for damage while not taking damage and just being very resilient. I feel like this is a pushed common. Like that. That's just those, those yeah. stats are just. I'm just really wary of good. giving fives too high of a grade because you just end up with so many fives. Yeah, that's true. That is true. You are right about that. Well, I'm still going to go B minus on bitter bow. All right, I got C plus on, on the sharpshooters. Um, Devotee of strength is two and a green for a three two Naga wizard at uncommon, and it's got an activated ability four and a green. Target creature gets plus two plus two until end of turn. Ooh, that's nice. Yeah, this is this is not too bad. It's a uh, Three and a three two is a fine a fine set of stats, and then the the threat of activation. It's when you have the man on tap for this, and uh, your opponent has to block with it in mind, but you don't necessarily have to use it. Is pretty strong here. Is that what threat of activation is? Yeah, it, it's when you get the threatened to activate the card. <laughs> yeah, now, the, that, the, this is really is, good though to be able to just, just like throw this threat around. of activation material though. Yeah, because you can do it on any creature, including what itself. What will happen is you'll just you'll just attack with your two creatures on turn five. They won't be able to block either. Then you'll just play another creature. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I, when you don't even have to use it. And if they and, yeah. and, and if they do block, then you get to just spend five mana to eat one of their creatures. Yeah, I think Devotee of Strength is very strong. I, you know, this isn't a particularly efficient ability, right? We're talking about using your turn worth of mana for this. But the ability to just have that up is very, very powerful. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm I'm a pretty big fan. Uh, I, I mean, I still, again... I'm not going nuts over these cards because five mana is a lot. And if they like have a cheap trick and just they wasted your turn, it's you actually do oh, fall pretty far true. behind. Yeah, you got to be careful what you target I, with I'm it. I'm still going to give this a C plus, I think. Well, no, I'm going to give this a go B, B minus. Yeah, yeah okay, I like cool. B minus on Devotee. I was going to try to talk you up, but you beat no, me. No, I, I got there. All right. So B minus for Do Devotee of Strength. Uh, what about Dune Diviner? This is a two and a green for a two, three Naga Cleric at Uncommon. Okay. You can pay one mana and tap an untapped desert you control to gain one life. This doesn't strike me as a builder and I'm all that interested in. Like, God, you yeah, know, yeah. I get it. Your deserts can gain you some life, but that's just not a big payoff. So three mana, two, three is just fine. And the ability is just fine. This looks like a C minus to me. Man, I the thing is I'm extra interested in life gain in this set. And I still don't know if this is enough. I really am interested in gaining there life because of the that, stuff we've been talking there are about. Also, like, there are some cards that pay you off for, for life gain. but And I mean, I, you can do more, right? Like I, if I have four mana and two of them are deserts, I can gain just two. I can just go tap, gain a life, tap, gain a life. Yeah, because you have to tap the desert as well. Okay. So. Yeah. But so I, what, I what, like what did you – I like C minus on Dune Diviner. I'm going to give him a C plus. Okay. I think that this incidental damage thing is going to be very real in this set and these uh, repeatable life gain effects that are on things that you are not like embarrassed to play are probably going to be more valuable. The problem, of course, is that if you don't have any deserts in your deck, it's just a blank. I mean, a two, three for three mana is not really what you want. And when you finally do draw your desert, you get to pay two mana to gain a life. Woohoo! <laughs> I'm like pumped up on this, although I did only go to, to, to C plus, so I'm not. Over the Ooh, moon. I like the next one, uh, Feral Prowler. Oh, this yeah. Is a one and a green for a 1-3 cat at common, and when it dies, you draw a card. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, I am in. Block. You just play this on turn two, and what, what's and you'll block no matter what. What, what yeah. can they have? A trick? All right, I'll draw a card. Yeah. So I love it. Yeah, I would give Feral Prowler a C plus and just always play it. I think so, too. I, I just think this is the perfect type of card against the aggressive decks. Uh, what about Frilled Sandwalla? <laughs> this is a, <laughs> this is a green cool mana. For, so one green mana for a 1-1. One, one. Lizard at common, and you can pay one and a green to give it plus two, plus two until a turn, but you can only activate that ability once each turn. So strictly worse basking root walla, but the flavor text flavor text does say it is basking, so I guess that counts. So uh, I think this card is pretty good in an aggressive deck. You get to just play it early, attack them. They can't block it for a while, and by the time you still want to start pumping mana into it, it'll trade off for something good or have dealt them, you know, three to six damage, something like that. Is this is this a playable one drop here in limited? Yeah, it, it definitely is. What, what, what you did you give You want to be it? aggressive, though. Because okay. If you, Why? You're I, see, I don't out, understand. So like, a good blocker. But. Like, this is where, like, threat of activation fails, right? Because... No, this, this I think, succeeds. Really? 
Well, like, don't they just say, can, sure, no blocks? Like, you, they take two damage for like, or two or three damage for the first couple turns. But if uh -huh. you have a low curve aggressive deck, you can start pumping this pretty early, and then then you end okay. up kind of getting ahead of curve. So I think it's going to okay. be fine. Again, you do want to be aggressive. I'm not just putting this in every deck. But I see. It's playable in an aggressive deck, which I think lands it at C. Okay, I'm going to go C minus, but I, I see what you're saying. That makes sense. I just, it, you know, the the for threat of activation to work. You, you have to also to threaten that if you, you, don't, don't. you don't. Yeah, like you but take three damage. But cheap enough that I think you're actually going to be fine using okay. it. Okay, okay, that's interesting. I like the name too, Frilled to Sandwall. The next card is called Gift of Strength. It's pretty straightforward. It's one and a green for an instant at common. It says target creature gets plus three, plus three, and gains reach until end of turn. That is a very serviceable combat trick, right? Two mana is about the most you want to pay, but it gives you a big bonus of plus three, plus three, you know, winning basically any combat and then occasionally you can use it defensively to to block a flyer as well. Yeah, you're not going to use it defensively all that often, but it's a nice no. option to have. I think at two mana, you can't really get excited about this, but it is a fine card. Yeah. And C minus or something, yeah. D plus, whatever. I would give, I would give Gift of Strength a C minus, I think. All right. Uh, this next card's easy to overlook, but you shouldn't. Uh, it's called Harrier Naga. It's two and a green for a 3-3 three, three Naga Warrior, and that's it. It's a common. There's no text. It's just flavor text. Okay. So This is, I think, a pretty easy C+. Plus. I do, too. I, th these cards are always Turning underrated. Is good. Yes, people always just go, well, it doesn't really do much, or they, they think it's boring. But you play this. Play it on turn three, and then tell me it's boring, because the, these cards do work. They're bigger than anything else at the two and three mana slot at common and, and many uncommons as well. So I think Harrier Naga is the type of card that is going to enable good green beat down at common um often it block it's like it's the perfect mid-range card for limited so I, I like it at cc plus for for harrier naga um what does hope tender do this is a one and a green for a two two human druid at uncommon you pay one tap untap target land so this does not generate mana it just lets you untap a land to use its effect or double up on mana of a certain color I see. but it has one tap exert hope tender untap up to two target lands or untap two target lands so it's a two mana two two that on turn three you can exert it and go up to four mana because you get to untap you know tap two lands and untap them both. That seems pretty good for a two two. I mean the, the I like first ability it. I think is not going to really come up ever unless you just need like double color of a color. Yeah. But I, the second ability means that you get to ramp and ramp is pretty important, especially on a two two which you know has other relevance at various points in the game. And like and and this is all tacked onto a two two for two just. Yeah. A fine, you know, starting point. Yeah, the card seems good to me. I mean, like you said, the first ability is not super relevant. But when you use the second one, it'll be very powerful. And the rest of the time, you've got a little solid two yeah, drop. This, so this looks like a C plus. C plus for Hope Tender, for sure. Uh, next card is called Life Goes On. Uh, it's green for an instant at, uh, at common. It says, you gain four life. If a creature died this turn, you gain eight life instead. How much life would you need to gain for a card to be yeah. good enough? How many times have we seen this discussion in the I, community? This I'm is not, not enough. Yeah. I'm not buying it, especially <laughs> and if you I want life gain. a creature will die. So. Yeah. I want life. Like I just said, I'm interested in life gain. I gain due diviner a higher grade than I normally would because I think I'm life gain is going to be enough. better. But I'm not giving this card anything. This is not playable still. No. Life goes on indeed. F. Uh, Nissa's defeat. All right. So here's another one of that cycle that you were talking about. This one's two and a green for a sorcery and uncommon. It says destroy target forest, green enchantment, or green planeswalker. If a if that permanent was a Nissa planeswalker draw card. This is one I'm not a huge fan of because I'm not citing in a three mana destroy a forest. No. There's not that many green enchantments, and there's certainly not that many Nissas. So, so we're this, just off of this one. This is, looks like a sideboard F to me. Yeah, sideboard F for sure. I mean, I guess if your opponent has Nissa, no, would maybe, you maybe they have sand, or Sandworm Convergence. So sure, sideboard D. Okay, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, next is called Oasis Ritualist, and this is a cool one. It's a three and a green for a two four Naga Druid. This card's common, and it taps to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So a little weird to have a four mana. You know, untap and you're kind of at, at six mana a lot of the time. But there, you know, any color and, and it is ramping you out to the big stuff. And it's a two four, uh, you know, body, which is a nice blocker. But it's got an exert ability. You can tap it and exert it. So this is not related to combat. And it adds two mana of any one color to your mana pool. So this is the, the, the ramp spells for people who really mean it because you, you, you play this on turn four and then on turn five you have access to seven mana and you can play whatever sweet seven drop you've got. 
I think a lot of green decks are just not going to want this, but the ones that want it are going to be pretty happy with it. Yeah, I mean, you know, green tends to be the more mid-range uh, end of the spectrum, and I think Oasis Ritualist just fits that. If you're splashing, you'll probably want it, and the 2-4 body, I think, is a, is a good thing, too. So I wouldn't be surprised to see this card pop up pretty often. Uh, it's a pretty good blocker, and it's a way to kind of overpower a quicker deck by, by coming out with uh, either splashes or, or a bunch of mana. I like it. I think it's a good card. Uh, I think it's like a C plus actually. I, I, I'm hopeful that it is because this is the type of card <laughs> that I is, like if to see this good. Is a C plus, then I'm, I'm happy with the format. Yeah, I, I'm going to give it a C, but I, I, I see what you're saying. I like your optimism. Can we just skip this next card? All right. Well, I don't want to do this, man. Look, before I even knew you, I thought it was ridiculous how much you hated Overrun, and <laughs> then I became comfortable enough to make fun of you, and then I, I proceeded to. Uh, but I was right. You were right. You were you were wrong. I was right. How are you right? Overrun is just a limited card like everything else, and sometimes it wins games. You can no. decide in a fog, and it's great. No, that that is so untrue. What we're what Luis is referring to is I back in the day I would really get on my soapbox about Overrun because I felt like it just ruined games of limited. Like you'd be playing a normal, just reasonable game, gameplay. and then it was just like pff, Overrun, and the game ended, and it's like, well, that's like. There's just nothing. There was no decisions at that point, and 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 the opponent could have just put any creatures in their deck. Literal, just you know, two. I, I still remember Owen messaging me like, "Who's this Marshall guy, and why is he ranting about Overrun?" <laughs> that's funny, but you know the story. It, it actually got interesting because uh, that's funny, but seriously, Overrun sucks. <laughs> it, it's awful, right? Like for for limited and. Uh, but what ended I, up happening was is Aaron Forsyth, you know, at the time looked into Magic Online data as a bait as a result of some of the discussion we so had. Deceptive. And he was like, you know what? You guys are right. Th this wins way too much. And they stopped printing it at Uncommon after that. After that, it was overwhelming right. Stampede and these rares. And somehow it's back. So we've got Overcome is the card, of course, that's sparking this <laughs> whole three discussion. Three green, green, sorcery yeah. at Uncommon. Creatures you control get plus two, plus two, and gain trample control. Not plus three, plus three. Right. This card is still quite good. It's great. It's going to be the same. It's like yeah. easier to cast. You're uh. going to put it in your deck. It's going to lead to some interesting combats, some good gameplay. <laughs> Whatever, <And> man. It, <laughs> people don't know how much you're trolling. If you've never been on the bad end of one of these cards, you're just like, oh, the game's over. And here, I'll explain it really quickly. The way it plays out is if they have three or more creatures, you lose. And if they don't, then they play it if they have like a bunch of smaller creatures and you're forced to make a bunch of blocks so that you lose most of your board and then you go to a critically low life total and their creatures survive and then you lose the next turn. <laughs> That's just how these cards work. I don't well, know, man. I, think I, hate, I hate seeing this here. I think it's pretty good. Like I, it, I think it is going to be a very strong uncommon. I think you're going to take it a lot of times you'll see it. And I think yeah. that – Regardless of how you feel about the gameplay, this is a card that will win you games of limited. Totally. So, and and for uh, the purposes of the set review, I think this card is going to end up being a B or a B plus. I think it's going to be like a B plus. I think yeah. it is a good card. So. I, mean, I think it's a great card. Like, again, all it cares about is that you have critical mass of creatures. So just make sure you don't need to be a go wide token deck to make overcome good. You just need to play, you know, some number of Harrier Nagas and two two for twos and you're just going to win when you resolve it. So do that. In the meantime, I'll you know, put my soapbox away and, and we'll talk about it some other time. But the card's great what, and you should play it. What about a Quarry Beetle? Quarry Beetle. Uh, four and a green. I've never seen this card. Four and a green for a four, five insect at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield, you may return target land card from your graveyard to the battlefield. The, the first place my mind goes is Deserts. You deserts. Sack like, desert, like desert, desert, desert. Yeah. Okay. You get to Quarry Beetle it up. Uh, secondly, it's like random cards that you discard for an effect, which, yeah, there are some of those, but not like an insane amount of them. Uh, I do like a 4-5 for 5, but again, you mentioned it earlier, the 5-drop slot's so contested yeah, that a vanilla 4-5 is not good enough. Yeah, I guess this Quarry Beetle's a C, and if that you have a couple too. ways to get a land into the graveyard, great. Yeah, it's, it's just you're, no you're, you're, never, yeah, you're, you're never really going off, right? Yeah. You're not like, oh, wow. Uh, next card is called Rampaging Hippo. Yes, I love hippos, man. These are, these are to great. Feed. Uh, <laughs> this is 4 green green for a 5-6 trample hippo at common, and a cycling of 2 colorless. So... Uh, not the greatest of all sandworms, but a still a, a pretty big beater, six mana, five, six trample, and then you can cycle it for two mana. This looks fine. I, I hope it lives up to our expectations. Really what the, this card will hinge on is mostly how burdensome it is to cycle. Do you right. have time to do that? Because the actual question. card itself is fine. 
Totally. And and we faced this question in Amonkhet and the answer was quite burdensome. And if it is here too, then this will go down. But man, I tell you, I'll tell you what, if a year ago you walked up to me and said, what do you think about this card for limited? I'd be like, that is a great card. Like right. six mana, five, six tramples already totally fine. Like that's affecting the board, you know, hard to deal with, hard to kill, good blocker, good attacker card. And when I'm missing land drops, I just cycle it. I would just would have been like, that card's fantastic. And, you know, Exert has has whittled me down to very skeptical <laughs> of even good cycling cards. So I think I'm going to give Rampaging Hippo a C plus because I want to remain optimistic that that type of thing might still be good because uh, this is very good, you know, good enough early and, and solid late. But if it's still a fast format like it was before, that that grade will go down. Yeah, I, I'm going to start at C, but I, I agree with all the points you're saying. Uh, Ronus' Stalwart is next. It's one and a green for a 2-2 two, two human warrior at common, and it says you may exert it when it attacks. If you do, it gets plus one, plus one until end of turn and can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less this turn. Yeah, there's a lot of cards in the set that are still really punishing to blockers, so we'll, we'll see how things end up. Uh, we see where that that took us in Amon Cat. Man, but, yeah, I just keep thinking of overcome. Like these are the type of cards that like chip in some damage and then boom, the game's over. Ronus Stalwart uh, looks great to me. It looks very solid, right? I mean, it's, it taxes it's no Gus three, Walker, three. but still, this looks like a C plus. This looks like what Gus Walker should have been. Uh, I agree. Yeah. S- uh, C plus for Ronus's Stalwart. Very solid two drop at common. I, you will be playing those and facing them down. Uh, Sidewinder Naga. That artwork is great, by the way. Uh, it's two and a green for a three two naga warrior at common so a three two for three man is not ideal but it's fine but if you control a desert or if there's one in your graveyard it gets plus one plus so and gets trample i would play a four two trample for three mana again i'm not blown away by that right you know that's somewhere in the c plus range i think on average but it's pretty good like that's fine given that it's a c plus when everything comes together this card can't be higher than like a c Right, because you do need to do the whole desert thing. Uh, I guess his Sidewinder Naga ends up at a, at a C. Yeah, it might even be a C minus, like given that it does take some work. Uh, Sifter Worm is next. Ooh, I it's, love this one. Oh yeah, why don't you read it? <laughs> it's five green green for a seven seven trample. When it enters <laughs> okay. the battlefield, scry three, then reveal the top card of your library. You what gain the? life equal to that card's converted. Mana what? Card. <laughs> oh my god! Wow, that's so, great. Seven mana, seven, seven that gains you a bunch of life. Assuming you scry, you know, you're supposed to scry an expensive card at the top. Another that's, that's seven drop in your insight. case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's good. It runs with Palaka Worm. Palaka Me Laka. too. That was a, a really good finisher. Basically a, a seven drop that actually like catches you back up, which this will do if it gains you like four or five life. Right. Uh, is it, is very strong. It also gets better because there's a lot of the cards like Rampaging Hippo. You get to play more expensive cards with cycling. So you just get to have more fives and sixes in your deck than you normally oh, would. Oh, I see. Even if uh, even if a lot of the times you only end up paying two, uh, right. you know, for your hippo because you're just cycling it. That's interesting. Yeah, so so I, I'm into Sifter Worm. Uh, that this, is this does make me look back, play. by the way, at Beneath the Sands, you know, the ramp spell and, and then the uh, the Oasis yeah, Ritualist go, like up, go up a little bit. Hit, yeah, hit that's step, yeah. that's a serious payoff. I like that, Sifter Worm. Where, where do you grade it? B? I would give Sifter Worm a B. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, you can't just throw sevens in your deck without building around it, but this is actually worth building around. Like, yeah. If you have like two cards like Sifter Worm in terms of payoffs, I think ramp seems pretty real. I agree. Uh, last green card is called Tenacious Hunter. It's two green green for a crocodile. It's uh, uncommon. It's a 4-4. Four, four. So we've got a 4-4 four, four for four, which is, yes, I'm in for that. It yeah, says as great. long as a creature has a minus one, minus one counter on it, it gets vigilance and death touch. What the... <laughs> That's any creature? It's weird. So yeah, it's any creature. So it's your side or theirs. The death touch doesn't matter too much. Four no, because it's just huge. Are pretty much the same as 4-4s. Four but Vigilance is a pretty big ad. And I like the story. There's someone weak around. It becomes very, well, tenacious and hungry. Oh, so, I see. I even see it on the artwork now. Yeah. Blood in so, the water, huh? Uh, I, I, I like the new center. Four mana, 4-4, four, four, no text would, I think, be like a B-. And this is... Yeah, this is a slightly better than that. I would give it a. I would still probably give it a B minus or a B. Yeah, I think a B for Tenacious Hunter. Yeah, seems B seems good. fine. Yeah, you know what about the Death Touch when you're attacking? So you're like, I have a Vigilance creature. I attack. It makes it punishes double blocks. I think is a, a big little bit, that. but yeah, okay, whatever. I, I give a B for Tenacious Hunter. Also, man, I, I really like green in the set. Like it just seems sweet to me, but I'm I'm concerned that it's a little on the on the slow end. Uh, given what we saw I mean, from Ramp. It has a lot of Ramp spells. We'll see how that ends up. All right, let's move on to White. 
Uh, Act of Heroism is our first white card. Pretty straightforward card as well. It's one and a white for an instant. It says untap target creature. It gets plus two, plus two until end of turn and can block an additional creature this turn. This seems fine. Yeah, you, another, you, another fine combat trick, right? Yeah, you're going to get some value off the untap and some value off to be able to block two creatures every now and then, but mostly you're just playing it for two mana for plus two, plus two, yes. which is passable. C minus, D plus. It's in that same sort of, sure. I'll give, give back to from a C minus. Okay. Uh, this next one's called Angel of the God Pharaoh. It's four white, white for a four, four flying angel at uncommon, and it has cycling for two. So here's like another this. good cycling, you know, another good six drop that you can cycle. Wing Shepherd ended up being pretty good, and I think this is significantly mm -hmm. better. Yeah. It, it costs more to cycle, but a 4-4 four, four is so much better than a 3-3, three, three, even Seriously. losing Vigilance. So, totally. Uh, I would give Angel of the God Pharaoh a B-. minus. I think you're going to be really happy with this card in your deck. God, I hope so, man. I, again, if the format's just blazing fast, this card is yeah. just off my four, radar four again. Flyers are just, like, so good. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'm going to join you. I was going to say C+, plus because I'm pessimistic that I still think this format is going to be fast, but... Again, you would have showed this card to me a year ago. I would have said, wow. So uh, B minus for Angel of the God Pharaoh. Next is Aven of Enduring Hope. This is four and a white for a 3-3 three, three flying bird cleric at common. And when it enters a battlefield, you gain three life. Perfectly playable. Uh, yep. I would be happy to play it in a deck. Even an aggressive deck, it's just good value. Like it's really hard to, to lose a race when you're just dropping cards like this. So yeah. Uh, I like it at C plus. Me too, and 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 like I said, I'm really I'm I'm very pro life gain in this set. You know, I'm not willing to play the life gain only card still, of course, but like this type of effect, I'm really wanting because I do feel like afflict and incidental damage sources are going to add up in a big way, and and having a way to recoup some of the early losses is going to be a big deal. And I think even during hope is as another example of a way to combat that. Um, what does Dauntless even do? This is two and a white for a bird warrior at common. It's a two one flyer, and whenever it attacks, untap target creature you control. So, two one flying vigilance. It can untap itself. Uh, it can also combo with exert creatures. Give one of your bigger blockers vigilance. Use an activated ability, what have you. <clears throat> I like this card. It's I do very too. efficient. Uh, I would give it a C plus. I do too. I think Dauntless Haven has a lot of, of potential that, that you don't see right away. But then when you start doing it, you know, you think of cards from the previous set like Fan Bear and things like that. We were like, you can just do a lot of cool things with it. Um, and then the fact that it's hitting in the air for two uh, is, is, you know, makes it more likely to be able to attack repeatedly where, you know, uh, creatures on the ground have a harder time with that. So I think Dauntless Haven is just positioned well. And I, I like it at C+. Desert's Hold is next. What does this card do? It's two and a white. It's an enchantment or an uncommon. <clears throat> uh, enchanted creature can't attack or block, and its activated abilities can't be activated. So three mana to arrest a creature. Just can't attack, can't block, can't activate its abilities. And then it also says that when Desert's Hold enters the battlefield, if you control a desert or the desert in your graveyard, you gain three life. Well, I'm sold. Yeah, I'm hold. Uh, it's a good card. You don't need the desert part. You would play this in any white deck. But if you have a desert bonus, and it's not a card I'm going to strive for to, to try to combine with deserts, but, you know, every now and then it'll gain you three, and that'll be great. Yeah, and, and like I said, I'm putting a little bit more of a premium on life gain like that than I normally would. So I, I think Desert Sold is just fantastic. Uh, you know, in a really fast format, these tend to lose a little bit uh, of, of their – appeal but still i'm just gonna go b plus on deserts hold i just think that like uh, a fairly unconditional way to take out anything on the other side of the battlefield including utility creatures including bombs uh is just it's just really good and then you know the incidental life gain is is a bonus yeah i like b plus on deserts hold uh disposal mummy is two and a white for a two three zombie jackal at common and it says when it enters a battlefield exile target card from an opponent's graveyard yeah, this card is very mediocre. You Mad. you will snipe an Eternalized card or an Embalm card every now and then, but you want to be able to play your three drop on three and it won't do anything then. And then later in the yeah. game, it's just not that high impact. So this looks like a D. It's a D. Uh, the most important thing about this card is that it's a zombie. So if yeah, you're doing some, zombie, some zombie things, decks, that's it. Yep. Uh, next is Jeru's Renunciation, which is one and a white for an instant. It's un Excuse me, it's common. And it says, tap up to two target creatures. Uh Instant speed, tap up the two target creatures can be very powerful. You can do it on your opponent's turn before they go to combat. That taps down two potential attackers and two potential blockers, which can be a very big swing. And then in the scenarios where you're not really in a position to do that, you can cycle it for white. 
Yeah, this is another situational card with cycling, which tends to be a good place to put cycling. I think if I was playing an aggressive deck, I would fit this in if I could, but it wouldn't be overly worried if I couldn't. And in a slower deck, I would not want to play this. Yeah, I have nothing bad to say about Jero's Renunciation, but experience tells me that I will not play this as often as I would yeah, think. This looks like a C minus probably. I think so too. Uh, Dutiful Servants. This is sort of the natural... Uh, of those who serve. Yeah, those who serve. It's three and a white for a zombie. It's a two five. If you want a zombie, you'll play this. If otherwise, you probably won't. The stats aren't great. Looks like They're a just classic passable. D to me. Yeah, this looks like a D. D for dutiful. Uh, what about Gideon's defeat? That's the this next is, one uh, of that cycle. One white mana. It's an instant and uncommon. Exile target white creature that's attacking or blocking. If it was a Gideon's planeswalker, you gain five life. This looks like a, a, a sideboard B. Yeah, I think so too. It's good it removal against the right deck. So yeah. A mm -hmm. little worse than Chandra's defeat, but still one mana to kill any creature that's attacking or blocking that's white is, is still great. Yeah. And it exiles it too. So that could pop up. Uh, you know, white does have some uh, eternalized creatures. So, so sure. Uh, Sideboard B for Gideon's defeat. God Pharaoh's Faithful is one white mana for a zero four human wizard at common. And whenever you cast a blue, black, or red spell, you gain one life. Uh, Man, I told you that I wanted that I was prioritizing the life incidental life gain a little higher, but I don't think I'm doing that here. This, this, so this I think would be an F if we just use the normal grading scale. You just would never play this card, but I think it's actually like a sideboard C, where really? against a, against a lot of decks that attack you on the ground with two and three power creatures with afflict. Well, afflict makes this worse. Exert makes this worse. But every now and then you'll run against a, an opponent who has the right set of stats where this card can prevent a bunch of damage and then gain you a couple life. In the sure. Game. Like if you're playing against green and they have a 2-2 two, two or a 3-3, three, three, this card's actually quite good. Yeah, I, I think so. Except for their 2-2 two, two exert creature gets by this also. So <laughs> whatever. <laughs> this you card know, sucks. Blocking in 2017. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make make blocking great again. Uh, God's yeah. Pharaoh's Faithful I don't think is the is the champion to do that for uh, us. I, I'm going to give a it a D. sideboard C. But okay. I'm just going to give uh, it a D. Mummy Paramount is one and a white for a 2-2 two, two zombie at common. Whenever another zombie enters the battlefield of your control, Mummy Paramount gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. So this is a classic uh, build around. I wouldn't give it a build around grade because I think it, it is a two-minute 2-2 two, two by itself and every white deck is going to have a couple zombies. Mm -hmm. But this card goes from like C to C minus to like B minus in a good zombie deck. Yeah. If you're triggering it every turn once or twice it's and it's a three, three for two. <laughs> yeah. So, with, so, with, a, with a relevant creature type, of course. So I think I'll overall probably give it a C, but just know there's a lot of upside here. Yeah. It wants to be in an aggressive zombie deck for Mummy Paramount. That's the, yeah, that's, that's the, the, the secret to success. Play zombies with your card that cares about zombies. Yeah. And it does work. I, I, I had a chance to play with that card already. So <laughs> that you said you had a chance to, to play with zombie decks in this format already, <laughs> in well, which case, yes. Kind of. Yeah. Uh, Oketra's Avenger, uh, one in a red, uh, excuse me, one in a white for a three, one human warrior at common. And it says you may exert it when it attacks. If you do prevent all combat damage that, that would be dealt to at this turn. Yep. I mean, I was, like I said, like I said in my written survey, I was just hoping for more cards that, that were impossible to block. You know, two, two, three power two drops. Yeah. How about three power two drops that can just attack Giant with spear. impunity? Like, look at that spear. That's, I don't know if it's perspective or something, but that spear is the size of her head. Like, the perspective really doesn't look quite right and it just looks huge. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, this card's just typical yeah, for what we've seen. I mean, yeah. It's, it's just, just a hyper aggressive card. Peter. Yeah, these cards are really annoying, man. I, I'm getting sick of these things. I like blocking yeah. occasionally. Uh, one thing to note, though, is that it, it's not indestructible, right? This card yeah, it just prevents uh, combat prevents damage. damage. Yeah, combat yeah. damage. So you can still burn it at instant speed and have it die or use any other effects. Like the next one called Sandblast. Two and a white for an instant at common. So this is one of your... Uh, this is your common white removal spell. Sandblast deals five damage to target attacking or blocking creature. Yeah, this looks fine. I, take, I don't take like that it as impeccable much timing. in aggressive decks, but I like this more than impeccable timing because it actually kills things. Impeccable timing is a little small. This mm -hmm. will kill just about everything. So yeah, Even through a combat trick yeah. often. Yeah. I, I'm not like 
over the moon about Sandblast. I think it's a C plus, but it is, I think, a fine card. Yeah, I think it's a C or a C plus. Remember, white, at least from what we've seen here, looks like it wants to be attacking. And using Sandblast on a blocker never really feels that great. Like, you do it because you need to clear the blocker out of the way, but they get to block first. Mm. And then that is not a ton of value. Right. Uh, Saving Grace is next. It's one and a white for an enchantment at Uncommon. It's got Flash and it enchants a creature you control. So it's an aura. And it says, when it enters the battlefield, all damage that would be dealt this turn to you and permanence you control is dealt to enchanted creature instead. Kind of interesting. And enchanted creature gets plus zero, plus three. This card is real weird. So it's, at its base level, yeah, weird. You can you can win a combat if you have like two three threes bouncing or a four four and a four four bouncing. Uh, where it gets a little more complicated, you can sometimes like get a two for one where like you're. You have two two twos, they have two two twos, and they both get in fights, and you're like saving grace. Now I have a two five and it prevents damage that would happen to my other two two. But it can also be a combat trick that won't work because like they're attacked with two three threes and you have a three three, and you're like, block your three three saving grace. My guy still dies because your other three three hit me for three. Right, but but they're but the two three threes that the other two three threes, you get to just eat the other one, right? You get to eat one. Yeah, you get to eat but, one, and but then you'll lose your creature. You lose the one with saving grace on it. Yeah. Uh, also, it's got a nice little combo with Catcher's Avenger. Someone pointed out, like they, uh, you attack, exert all damage is prevented to it, and you <laughs> saving grace and just mop that's, it up. That's great. Uh, also, this is a strange answer to like overcome. Yes. Uh, like you, you're probably throwing away your creature, but you know, in a worst case, yeah, you, you it, know, it is a fog. Your, yeah, you, you put it, it on save your worst you creature. You can save a ton of damage too. Also, in a race, like you have a four four, they attack you with like, you know, a three three flyer and a two two flyer or something. You're like saving grace. I just prevented five to myself and yeah. attack them back. So, and then you can also just use it as a plus o plus three at instant speed in case that would win you combat. Yeah, I think you add all this I have up. No I'm idea. Still a I just skeptical of this card. I am too, but I, I, I have the gut feeling. That in the hands of a good player, <laughs> you're going to be able to, you know, craft a scenario where you get a, a, a yeah. good it's amount of value high, from Saving Grace. It's going to be highly dependent. This is situational. But I'm, I'm going to give Saving Grace a C, but know this card has like a, a wide range on both sides. I'm going to go B- minus on Saving Grace. Okay. I have no idea. but All right. That I plays, just, I guess. Seems good. Uh, Solitary Camel. Yes. That's my boy. Two and a white for a 3-2 Camel. It's uh, common. It says uh, it has lifelink as long as you control a desert or there's one in your yard. Yeah, I, I'm okay with this. I yeah. mean, three minute three two lifelink would be good. You'd always just play that. Yeah. And this has lifelink some amount of the time. I, I mean, it's not great. Like you have to have deserts or because a three minute three two is like not impressive. But I do think that you're going to end up playing this in a decent amount of your decks. Oh yeah. Probably going to give it a C minus. Me too. Yeah. It, it's kind of sweet. It does get up to like C You know plus. we're giving it a, 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 a bump because it's a camel, right? Obviously, like, right? I mean, like, look, look at him. The art is actually pretty great too. Ma so. Majestically standing. Yeah, yeah. he's great. Uh, Steadfast Sentinel is our common eternalized creature. It's three and a white for a two, three with vigilance. So let's just time out right there. Eh, that's that pretty bad, right? Yeah, pretty bad. Uh, but it has eternalized for four white white. So you can pay four white white and exile it from your graveyard and it comes back as a four four with vigilance. That bumps it up to a C for me. I think so too. It's fine. But man, the, the first half is really Yeah, You're, you're not, not going to – I think you're going to play this more often than you will not play it. Like it is not a great card, but I think it is definitely passable. Mm, if I had to guess, I'd say that you'd play it less often. Not by a lot, but I, I would put it – right. put the uh, slightly on the other side of that. I think it's a C minus or a C. I guess all the eternalized cards kind of battle for the same slot because mm -hmm. they're so expensive to bring back. Yeah, but there's a few that are cheaper. In fact, one we're going to talk about in a minute, but for the most part, they're like six mana ish. Yeah, they're good though. They scale with the game a lot better than uh, Embalm than Bomb well. did. Yeah, it, you know, in Bomb you were paying quite a bit and getting like a two drop <laughs> late in the game. Here, like you pay six mana, you're getting a six mana worth of creatures at least roughly. A four four vigilance for six is like okay, sure. Uh, you know, you'd rather probably pay five, but whatever. Uh, it, it scales much better. So I'm going to go C for Steadfast Sentinel. I'd yeah, I like C as well. Playable. We'll see where it lands. Uh, Steward of Solidarity is one and a white for a 2-2 two -two human warrior at Uncommon. You can tap it and exert it. If you do, you get a 1-1 one -one white warrior creature token with Vigilance. Card is absurdly good. <laughs> That's sweet. Two mana for a 2-2 two -two and every other turn it pumps out a 1-1 one -one Vigilance. If you have any tricks like Dauntless Haven, it just goes off. And oh, that's awesome. It's already a two-minute two-two that taps to make another creature. No mana, nothing. Just right. tap it. 
I mean, it doesn't to make for a, a turn, but yeah, but it, it, but it makes a one-one white warrior token with vigilance too. Those are yeah. useful little creatures. So. Every other turn, just for free. So I'm loving it. This looks like a B plus to me. Like yeah, I'll, I'll think, say B. It's a little slow. I think every deck is going to be so happy with it. It costs two mana. I think you're right. I think I don't think it's ever going to get cut from a white deck, but I don't think it's going to be like profound on the battlefield. Like it's good, but it you know. I think this. I think this is probably the best white common or uncommon. No. Yeah, it could be. Let's take a look at this next one because uh, I think this card's quite good. Um, th I, I do think Steward of Solidarity is better, by the way. Uh, I have B. You said B plus for it? Yeah, I like okay. B plus for Steward of Solidarity. Uh, Sun Scourge Champion is another uncommon. And it's two and a white for a two, three human wizard. And when it enters a battlefield, you gain life equal to its power. So, so two, two and a white, two, three, gain two. Yeah. But it's eternalized. And it's eternalized cost. They mess with it a little bit. It's two white, white. And discard a card to eternalize it, which is really powerful. Yeah. It makes a 4-4 four, four that it gains you four. So mm -hmm. really hard to beat this card in a race. And discarding a card sucks. Like, it does actually make this card, like, not card advantage. But totally. you still get card quality advantage because you're discarding your worst card in getting a 4-4 four, four that gains four so for only four mana, which is a really, really good deal. I would... I would say Scum Scourge Champion is also a B plus. I do think Steward is a little bit better. Okay, yeah, I, I'll go B B plus for for this one as well. The play pattern of play it, gain two, go. They attack you, block and trade, and then you untap, play a land, eternalize it is nasty. Uh, yeah, that you can even discard another creature with eternalize if you really want to get fancy. Sure, yeah, I like it. Uh, Sun Scourge Champion B B plus. Uh, same with Steward, and two more uncommons for white. First one's called Unconventional Tactics. It's two and a white for a sorcery. It's uncommon, and it says target creature gets plus three, plus three, and gains flying until end of turn. But it says whenever a zombie, by the way, two and a white for a sorcery that, that gives your creature flying and plus three, plus three, probably not what you'd normally want. Like, that's a lot of damage, but it's just a one shot, except for in this case where it says whenever a zombie enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay white if you do return unconventional tactics from your graveyard to your hand. This is the kind of card that will make it difficult to beat a zombie deck in the league because you've stabilized at 10. They're like, unconventional tactics attack you for five with my 2-2 two, two zombie. Right. Now you're just dead to any other zombie. Yes. Like th This is an actual legit zombie build around. That is a I, total late game plan. If I if I pick up unconventional tactics like third pick after I've taken like two white cards, I'm really going to be on the lookout for zombies because this just does 10 to 15 damage in the late game if your opponent just, you know, Turtles around too much and gives you time to, to keep using this. And I'll tell you what, I was uh, just poking around at the set and I did a search for zombies and there's a lot. Th th there's there's even more in this set than before, especially <laughs> you in, can in also white and black. You discard it to Sun Scourge Champion and immediately get it back. Ooh, because it's a zombie. I like that. Yeah, yeah I, I like this as a build around, like you said, and I think it's like a build around B. Like, I think this actually just is a game plan yeah, for one of these decks. Yeah, you don't want to play this in a non-zombie deck, but if you have three or four zombies even, this looks good. Yeah, and if, if you're in, in a zombie aggressive. deck, it's just, yeah, yeah it's just really yeah, solid. I like, I like build around B for unconventional tactics. Yeah. Uh, of course, the downside to it is that it's a sorcery, so it's effectively only an offensive card. I'm also so. really glad that a card called unconventional tactics is a build around because uh, I think that's <laughs> <laughs> Also, the art's funny. It's like lemmings are just yeah. getting thrown. Anyway, last uh, white card is called Vizier of the True. It's three and a white for a 3-2 human cleric. Not great, right? Four mana, three, two is really yeah. not where we want to be. Um, but it says you can exert it as it attacks. It says, and this is another one of those, whenever you exert a creature cards, tap target creature and opponent controls. Yikes. This is another card that's going to make it really difficult to block. You're going to play Vizier on like turn four, turn five. Man, where have and I heard that your, story like, before? Uh, what is it? Oketra's Avenger and tap their like four four. They take three. The next turn you exert Vizier, tap something else. Like, Ugh. yeah. Uh, this card looks like a B minus to me. It does to me too, and I, it's scary. These type of cards are so scary. The I mean, only saving that, grace is that it does. I mean, th th this reminds you of Oncrop Crasher. The but. only saving grace is the card called Saving Grace. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. And and I, I kind of like that one, too. I think Vizier of the True is probably like a B minus. I mean, like I said, I compare it in my head to On Crop Crasher, where but yeah. Crasher's three mana with haste and this is four mana without. But this one, um, 
it's you got know, like can have a mass effect because it's effect. Yeah, it starts, exactly. Yeah, starts working. So. I still think it's really. I, 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 actually, I'm just gonna go B. I'm just gonna say B on yeah. Vizier of the True. Oh yeah, that plays. White it looks aggressive again, man. Looks looks very aggressive. Yeah. So, well, interested to see how, how this ends up panning yeah. out. And let's move on to blue. Our first card in blue is called Aerial Guide. It is two and a blue for a 2-2 with flying. It's a drake, which is appropriate for a 2-2 flying for two and a blue. Uh, It's uh, common, and it says, whenever it attacks, another target attacking creature gains flying until end of turn. (laughs) Look, I didn't want to block anyway, I swear. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. Jeez. This card's great. Really? That's that's seriously a good card because, you know, you think of Wind Drake as sort of the default, which is ranges from kind of not so great to pretty good. And this just has like a huge bonus on it. Yeah, this means if you when you go two drop into Aerial Guide, your opponent's just in for taking like 12 damage unless they have a, a flying blocker, which often they will not. Man, blocking is just out, right? Like. Yeah. Blocking in 2017. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so aerial guy. It, like. it does feel like that, and this is I mean, a this common. is a common. Yeah. This is a. There's a couple of blue commons. Uh, you know, I, I spoiler alert. I may have reviewed these cards for ChannelFireball.com. For, you for check your out the website. Yeah, yeah. That. For your, <laughs> yeah, the for your written review. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's some other aggressive blue commons, and as a result, I wonder if blue is going to ha- legit have an aggro deck because in most limited formats, including Emonket. Blue was not a very good support card for aggro decks. Like you had blue white flyers, but blue green, blue black, blue red, none of those were aggro decks. Mm -hmm. And Hour of Devastation has some commons which kind of point me towards thinking blue can legit just be a beatdown deck. You could have like a a sweet blue red beatdown deck or a blue white beatdown deck that wasn't just straight up flyers. I mean, Aerial Guide, of course, does promote that play pattern, but there's just a lot of good blue cards that give you an incentive to attack and aerial guide is really high among them. I, I think aerial guide is like a B. It feels like it. And that's, in that's a, let's say in a heck of a lot, uh, best pairing would be green. I'm assuming maybe red. I think that in some senses, yes, green, because yeah, giving your like four, four is flying, right. makes sense. But I actually wonder if like red and white end up being better because they just have great two drops and mm. more plentiful two drops and you can just like i said if you play a two drop especially like a three power two drop into an aerial guide your opponent's just going to be look at their hand and they're like well i can't kill the aerial guide and i have a normal curve of ground creatures i'm going to be at like five yeah <laughs> before i get to play anything defensive so yeah i, I like b minus for aerial guide that, that card just yeah. very powerful i think b minus is on the balance probably the best grade for it but it is very close to just being I mean, it seems like the best blue common, and it seems like a card you'll be taking early a lot of the yeah. time. Uh, even Reed Stalker is next. It's three and a blue for a two, three bird warrior at common. It's got flash and flying. So you can play it at instant speed, and it's a two, three flyer for four. I'm not super high on the Reed Stalker. I, I mm-hmm. think the card is fine. You're, you're going to ambush some aerial guides with it. I, I, maybe that actually makes it a little better. But, yeah, could be. But it's a little it's a little small for how much mana you're paying into it. and. Mm-hmm. If you leave mana up for this on turn four, playing against a you know a KG opponent, they're either going to attack if they have like a one mana trick or a two mana trick, or they're just going to pass and you're just not going to get tons of value out of it. So don't look at this as just like a straight up two for one every time. No, the way I view this is that there's a there's a ceiling on how good it can be because if it is a good card in the format, then the scenario that you just described happens way more often where people just figure it out. And if it's not that great of a card in the format, meaning that you don't see it as often, then you might be able to get somebody occasionally. But, you know, even after getting getting gotten once by the Avon Reed Stalker, you're going to, your your uh, little red light in the head, in the back of your head's going to be spinning when your opponent, you know, passes with four mana up. I mean, it probably gets a little better because, you know, cycling and things like that. But yeah, overall, not a super powerful card, but it seems fine. I mean, this to me just seems like a C. Yeah, it's just a classic C. Yeah, even Reed Stalker gets a C. Next is called Countervailing Winds. This is two and a blue for an instant. It's common. It says counter target spell unless its controller pays one for each card in your graveyard. And it also has cycling for two. This is an interesting card. Very. The, without the cycling, this card would be horrendous. Yes. Because it does nothing on turn three, often does nothing on turn five. And be, kind of turns into a hard counter later, right? Once you have seven cards in your game. It definitely does, card. yeah. Mm-hmm. Cycling changes that a lot because you can just cycle it when it's bad and you know it's never going to be dead. And it fits really nicely into the blue-red spells deck, which also plays nicely with its text naturally because you have your tormenting voice type cards and yeah. random cycling spells and whatnot. 
I think this is a card I'm not going to main deck in a lot of decks, but is going to be good in the spell heavy blue red decks. Yeah, I think the cycling decks and and the one that you described are the two that won it. You know, the blue black cycling deck from Amonkhet yeah. comes to mind as well. Ho- hopefully, that becomes a, a real thing. Yeah. It- Hasn't uh. been thus far. But I mean, generally speaking, I agree with your assessment, though, that I, I don't think I want countervailing wins too often. I, I'm, I'm not building around it, but, you know, I, I would give it like a D plus. Like it's not a great card, but in the right deck, it, it can perform. It's a D plus, And I think that you're going to end up being able to pick it up if you want it. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I think that they'll be going around the table. And remember, uh, just, you know, as a reminder, this is a small set. So we've got a, a common here. You'll be able to pick them up. Out of the two packs that you get of Hour of Devastation. Next card is called Cunning Survivor. It's one and a blue for a 1-3 human warrior. It's common. And it says, whenever you cycle or discard a card, it gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. And can't be blocked this turn. I think I was a little too high on this. Uh, there's two blue commons I think I was a little optimistic on in the in the written review. And after, you know, thinking about it more, I do like Cunning Survivor. I think that two drops end up being better than they look a lot of the time. And if this format mimics Amonkhet in most of the relevant ways, then Cunning Survivor, I think, is going to be a card you're going to be happy with in a lot of your decks. But if you don't have a lot of cycling cards, this is a little dorky. So, uh, Even if you do, is it even good? Like you hit for two occasionally with your two drop? Well, the fact that it's a clock later and if if it can block other two drops early, the problem is if the 1-3 can't actually block in this format, then I'm a lot less happy about it. Yeah. Like the but I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty is, low on this card. I, this card isn't like the. I, I am pessimistic about its ability to block, which is really what's getting me. Because, yeah, like I said, you know, you cycle a card and you get in for an extra damage or two is fine. But, you know, this isn't a Hecma Sentinels. This doesn't, you know, really interact with combat the way you want. Yeah, and I, I, I do think that uh, as a result, I, I'm at this point, I, I have Cunning Survivor as kind of like a C minus. Yeah, but I, I was going to go I, D plus. Yeah, yeah I was, I, I was going to say, I, I know you were going to give it a D plus. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, well, I think we'll have to see what the texture of the format is, like how many two twos and two ones, because there are more like red has two common uh, two a two two and a two one that this can block very well. OK, like, red, red doesn't no, have that matters. Like, the, com- yeah. the common two drop exert creature that just gets by it. So, OK, I think that's relevant. But yeah, not super high on cutting. So we're getting a D plus slash C minus. Yeah. Uh, next is Eternal of Harsh Truth. Now, this is a card I'm excited about. Uh, this is two and a blue for a one three zombie cleric it's uncommon and it's got afflict too and it says whenever eternal of the harsh truths excuse me of harsh truths attacks and isn't blocked draw a card yeah uh that's a cool the, card the text you know of scroll thief two and a blue one three whenever it damages the opponent to draw a card mm-hmm. is already a good card like that card was always playable and limited because what happens is you'll play this card on turn three and your opponent now is like well I, can, I can't attack my 2-2 two, two into it, first of all. Second of all, even if I, let's say, have a 2-2 two, two flyer that I played, if I attack and then play my card, and then next turn you're like, kill your creature, attack, draw a card, that's so bad. So oh, it's a leave, disaster, yeah. I have to leave two creatures back to block it. And so your Eternal of Hearth Truths is often going to be locking up multiple creatures because your opponent's afraid of a combat trick. Then when you look at the fact that there's cards like Aerial Guide, which all of a sudden make this card insane, Ooh. or... Or combat tricks, because this has provoke. Your opponent is forced to block it. <laughs> They're never not going to block this card because they don't want to just give you a free card. And Afflict starts draining your opponent for two uh, when they do that. And it, again, stacks so well with combat tricks. I think this card's great. I think you're going to be happy playing in any blue deck. And if there's an aggressive blue deck, it's going to force through the last points of damage really well. Yeah, I think this card's really sweet too. Also, just of note, th- this is a little different than Scroll Thief. Th- this one just triggers when it isn't blocked, uh, you know, for times when that pops up, <clears throat> where Scroll yeah, Thief it, actually had to deal damage. It's effectively the same, but it does actually have a trigger so that you get the card uh, before damage happens, which, well, you know, sometimes it matters. So I overall, I, I'm I, a I huge like, fan, though. I like this in any blue deck. You don't even have to combine with it because sometimes you just get the free wins of like playing this on turn three and your opponent just doesn't have an early play or you have a bounce spell for their first play and you're just really far ahead. Yeah. And when you do have a draw that combines well, this can just completely carry you. So can I give it I a B? I have Eternal Force Truth as a B. Yeah, sweet. I'll give it a B as well. Also, the, the most fun about it is just watch your opponent squirm when you play it because they're just like, oh, no, <laughs> even though it's not even hitting that hard uh, on, on either side. Uh, next is called uh, next card's called Imaginary Threats. It's two blue blue for an instant at uncommon. It says creatures, target opponent, controls, attack this turn if able. 
During that player's next untap step, creatures he or she controls don't untap. And it's also, da da da, it's got cycling for two. Yeah, this card's really weird. What a weird so, card. This does remind me of uh, what Inferno Jet, the, the deal six, because mm, okay. it's very situational and it has cycling. So when this card is good, it's going to be one of your best cards. You're going to like force your opponent to attack some two twos into your three threes, or you're going to force your opponent to attack when you're at 20 and they're at, you know, like 10. You take the damage, then you get two free turns of attacks. And when it's bad, you can just cycle it. So this card, again, looks very good in, in an aggressive deck and is actually kind of an interesting card in a, in a more controlling deck, even though I think it is less good there. So you're playing this on your opponent's turn. Is there any, does it matter when you play it as long as you're doing it before declare attacks? Like if you want to play it, at be, you want to play it at the beginning of combat generally, okay. uh, because you want them to eat, to have finished, like if playing haste creatures, if they're going to play one of those, or maybe if they're mm. tapping out pre-combat for something, mm -hmm. you get to cast this. The only time I'd want to play this like upkeep is if they, if they had like no cards in hand or you really wanted to make sure it didn't get countered and you wanted to play it upkeep so that it couldn't draw a counter spell if they're playing blue. Okay. And of course they've made it no tension in this whatsoever by putting cycling on it. Uh, what do we want to give it for a grade? Because that has to bump the power up a lot. Normally without cycling, I, I would be pretty concerned about the times when this card didn't look good. Like when your opponent wanted to attack you anyway, and it just right. was a completely dead card in your hand. Now though, you know, you, you have the out of cycling, of course, because that's just apparently how this block works, uh, with these conditional cards. Um, well, now that I'm thinking about it, it is possible you can play this uh, like on your turn or at the end of their turn just to get the untap part. Like there's actually times when that all matter. Let's say you untap and you draw this card and they have just three tapped creatures. You can just cast this right away. And their oh. Creatures don't tap. oh, that's interesting. I didn't think about that. And that might come up, especially in like a tight race where like imagine they have three flyers and you're at like two life and you draw this. You're just like, all right, cast this. Your flyers don't tap this next Right. Turn. Hit you for a bunch. Yeah. Okay. Where to give this, like this will be the last spell cast in a lot of games. Uh, I, I think this yeah. is probably like a C plus. I think in, in an aggressive deck that plays to the board, this card is good and you'll just want it as a finisher. You're not going to want it in like some of the mid range and controlling decks. And I can't imagine like taking this over like, I, oh, Aerial Guide or Eternal of Hearth choose to look at the five blue cards we've seen already. So Yeah, yeah I can't imagine that either. I, I think somewhere around C to C plus is where I'd put Imaginary Threats. Yeah, and Imaginary Threats will, of course, play out more like a D when you cycle it and an A when you don't because, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're often going to win but, I mean, the game. That, that's, that's where you want cycling. You don't right. want cycling on your Aerial Guide, right? Like right. Aerial Guide of cycling just doesn't make that much sense. Right. Okay, next is uh, Jace's Defeat. This is, once again, part of that whole cycle. Uh, what, what does this defeat do? It's a one in a blue instant at uncommon. It says counter target blue spell. If it was a Jace Planeswalker spell, scry two. Hmm. I'm blue spell. So any any spell that's blue, that means creatures, anything. Just counter it. Yeah. I'm hmm. a lot less high on this than the other sideboard cards that we've seen because, the, you know, Chandra's defeat or uh, Gideon's defeat, one mana removal spells. Jace's defeat is, is a counter spell, which first of all is less good than a removal spell. And right. second of all, uh, it is a two mana counter, which is not as nearly as efficient as a one mana removal spell. So I think it's just like a, a sideboard B like, no, it's like a sideboard C plus. Yeah. Like, that's what I was you, thinking too. You'll board it in when, when about half their cards are blue and you'll be fine with it. But mm -hmm. you're not like take, you're not taking this over like a mid range blue card unless you're just completely full on playables. Right. And that is the key with these sideboard cards. So sideboard C plus for Jace's defeat. Wow. This next card looks really powerful too. Uh, ominous Sphinx. What does this one do? Well, besides have an extremely ominous name, it's a three and, and blue artwork, blue. by the way. Yes, this card looks uh, terrifying. It's three blue blue for a four four flying sphinx at uncommon. So I'm in. I'm already in, unless it has some heinous drawback. Turns right. out the heinous drawback is whenever you cycle or discard a card, <laughs> target creature an opponent controls gets minus two minus zero until end of turn. So. Yeah, <laughs> significantly less than heinous. <laughs> Huge advantage. Uh, yeah, exactly. I like it, man. What that's this a card good does card. is besides be a five mana four four flyer, which is still good. We haven't met a limited format where that's not at least decent. Mm -hmm. Even if original Zendikar maybe challenged that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the ability means if you have mana untapped, not only can your opponent not get involved in combat with this, it's hard for them to get involved in combat just at all. Like, you have a 2-2 out. Are they going to attack your 2-2 into it when you have a tapped Ominous Sphinx in, like, three mana? Like Seems bad. Seems like you can just cycle a card there and kind of and kind of wreck them. So mm -hmm. 
this this looks like a B plus to me. Yeah, it does to me too. Uh, th- this is a kind of a classic. You know, they call these an air elemental, a five mana four four flyer. This one has significant upside. I think you'll be playing these a lot in blue. Uh, this next card's a little weird. It's called Proven Combatant. It's uh, blue for a one one. It's common. All right. Great. So I mean, that part we don't like. <laughs> now, it does have an activated ability, though, only from the graveyard. Of course, it's eternalized, and it eternalizes for four blue blue. So it comes back as a four four. That's it. So this is the card I think I overrated the most in the written set review. Yeah, this card seems awful. Uh, I don't think it's awful. I actually still don't think it's awful. Uh, I'm trying to think of what the uh, how, how I would uh, translate the advanced numerical rating into the kind of primitive letter grade but uh, i think i think since i gave it a two, you know it's a pretty direct translation i've read your reviews man <laughs> i i gave proven combatant the equivalent of like a c plus and really? i come down on it okay well, can, we, can, we, can i get you down to d no you can't get me down to d you can get me down to c minus okay and here's well let me explain, explain why, yeah. why why i'm there and what will make it you know go up or down from there I look at this and I look at something similar to a Festering Mummy or Sacred Cat. Okay. If the format pans out that way and there's a lot of two ones especially, then Proven Combatant is – if it's half a card on the front side and a, a card on the back side, that is not that bad. I think okay. that, that, that – it's, a, it's And an it's early an early play. play that affects the board, that whole deal? Yeah, because we, we got to a point in Amonkhet, you would just play all your one drops. Like this flies in the face of the things we've been preaching, but honestly, that's you know part of where where we ended up. Like mm-hmm. you you just played all the one drops. All the one drops were playable, and proven combatant actually works out well in that world. The the thing that I think is tripping me up a little is I think I'm overcorrecting because cartouches are gone, and cartouches were a big reason to play one drops. I mean, yes. there's there's fewer; they're not completely gone. And I think that uh it ends up that if a 1-1 one, one is not does not interact well on the first time, then this card is a little too expensive for what it's getting. Like if the front side is just a zero or close to a zero, then this card is not great. But I, I think the front side could end up being a card, you know, in enough of the games that you're happy to put this in your deck. I think, mm, I, think you're, to... I think you're off on that. Like I, I, yeah. I think the, the vanilla – like, you know, Sacred Cat had Lifelink. When you augmented it, it became a real card. Vestering Mummy – you know, could trade for a two toughness creature or pick off a, an annoying one toughness creature and really yeah. stop blocks. This just doesn't do any of those things. Yeah. And, and I do, I have come down on that. I think that you are going to play this card, but you're not always going to play this card. Okay. I think it is, but you it do is, think it'll see play. I think it'll see play. And I think it'll actually be like a fairly effective sideboard card. If your opponent has yeah, three, I like that. one toughness early attackers, just random two ones, Definitely. this card's a great sideboard. Definitely. Yeah. I love that. I love proven combatant for that. So just gives I, you I'm something to do late say, game. Yeah. I'm going to still say C- minus on Proven Combatant, but I'm not no longer as high as I was. Okay. I'm going to say D for Proven Combatant. I think it's the type of card you'd rather not have in your deck, but occasionally will. Uh, next is Riddle Form. Kind of a throwback style card here. It's one in a blue for an enchantment at Uncommon. And it says, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you can have Riddle Form become a 3-3 Sphinx creature with flying in addition to its other types until end of turn. And then also it gives it has an activated ability of two in a blue Scry one so this is an aggressive card it can be one of the things that's interesting about riddle form is you can pass with mana up and if your opponents like attacks you you just cast up maybe a non-creature spell and get to block and if they don't you can scry one you're not advancing your board if you do that but you might be able to you might be kind of messing up their game plan as well Mm -hmm. i I think the best use of this is in an aggressive spells deck which is kind of an oxymoron (laughs) Because you want to be triggering yeah. this every turn and bashing in, but you also you don't really want to do nine damage with this, have it die, and have no follow up because the rest of your deck is spells. How do you see it as a blocker? Seems okay, but not great. I'm not super high on riddle form. I think Me either the, the activated ability, by the way, is very slow. Right, two and a blue yeah. to scry one if is, you, is if you, like if you, if you use have that ability like three else. times, you're probably losing that game. Right, that's just too much mana to sink into something with such little impact. I, I would. I would say Riddle Form is a card I'll play in any deck with like 10 plus spells, but right. it's not a card I'm going to take early. It's not an Enigma Drake. You don't see a fourth pick Riddle Form and it's like, I'm going to draft blue red. Right. I think if you wheel Riddle Form, which will happen most of the time, you can put it in your deck, but don't don't prioritize it, which kind of makes it feel like a build around like C. Yeah, build like, around middle middle ground thing. That's how I'm yeah. seeing it too. Because, you know, what, one thing is interesting. You go Riddle Form, go. 
And then you go land go and they have to sit there and they're like, do I attack my two, two into the riddle form when you have three mana up? I, my guess is yes. Uh, I would probably not attack once and just play another card. Like what are the types of non-creature spells that your opponent can play? You know, uh, if you're Supreme sitting across. Supreme Will is an uncommon that lets you impulse, lets you look at the top four cards. In okay. The so there's one. That's that's a uncommon, right? That's an uncommon. You know, um, all of the pump spells don't work unless they have another creature to target. There's, there's Tragic Lesson, the draw two cards and discard a card unless you return a land you control, which isn't all it's that hot. Somewhat it's tragic fine. indeed. Yeah, the counter spells don't work outside of Supreme Will because it has that other mode. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's weird. It, lot, like, right, removal spell, they just, they'd have to target your creature anyway, I mean, so that doesn't do it. You could cycle or use Scries uh, to use the mana, but you're trying to think of what spells they could have to use advantageously. It's not that many. Yeah. Well, because this is cast a non-creature spell. This has, you know, this is not the thing that we've seen a lot of, which is what you mentioned, the the scry or cycle thing, which that opens up the door to a ton of cards, which Riddle Form does not well, become a Sphinx on. If you change the context a little bit, it actually opens the door where if you have multiple creatures in play, it's like turn three or four. Yeah, that that's where things get interesting. Because then if you attack and they're like, okay, pay three mana to whatever the new three mana deal three with red. Mm -hmm. to, to kill one of your creatures then block your other creatures then, yeah. then you're talking about a, a, a real blowout yeah or or even just pump spell my other guy yeah th there's a lot that can happen there so yeah i, I like build around c for riddle form though it it, it, it can be powerful it's just yeah, you this, really need to have a deck to support it yeah this is a weird one yeah it is uh seer of the last tomorrow is next it's two and a blue for a one four naga cleric it's common and we've got our mill card here it's blue tap discard a card target player Mills three. So top three cards of his or her library into his or her graveyard. Can so, I kill somebody with this? I, you know, it's the blocking thing, right? Like is a one for an actual blocker? It hasn't been. It hasn't been. And if it's not a blocker, I don't like this card very much. Another thing I don't like about this is that if you start going down the path of milling them, let's say you discard three cards, right? You mill them for nine. And then they kill Seer of the Last Tomorrow. If you don't have more mill, more seers, or like, you know, some compelling arguments from Emoncat, you're you did nothing. You accomplished nothing with those three cards. And oh no, no, that's not true. <laughs> you yeah, significantly you, hurt your own game plan by discarding right. three cards, right? right. Like you accomplished are, nothing in terms of winning the game, and yeah. you might have even milled eternalized cards. Yeah. So mill is kind of like lava spiking your opponent but not finishing them. It's kind of, you know, when you mill them but don't actually finish the game with milling, you really didn't do anything. Right, so, and and this one really punishes you because normally, like let's say that this was just uh, blue but tap. transfer is the it, old comment that was blue tap, mill them for two. Yeah, let's say it was that. Even then we would be like, oh, you really screwed up if you spent, you know, three or four turns doing this. Th this actually leaves like a lasting impact on the game because you've had to, to discard so many cards from your hand. Not a fan. Yeah. I I think that this could be a legit card if you just need a three drop that if it blocks well. But again, every time I see a card like Aerial Guide or, you know, like the Kenra, the two, three menace that gets plus two plus so, like I'm just thinking like, yeah, blocking still kind of sucks. So I, I'm pretty down on Seer of the Last Tomorrow. I am too. I, I'd assume it's like a D. Yeah. I like D at Seer of the Last Tomorrow. I mean, I'll, you know, talk to me in a month and I'll try to get somebody with it. Sure. But. This is one of the cards that can move. Yeah. This is an actual card that could... That could go somewhere else. Uh, what does Sinuous Striker do? I like this one. This is two to blue for a two two Naga Warrior Uncommon. You can pay a blue to give it plus one minus one till end of turn. So mm. it's kind of like a two two Water Courser instead of a two three, which is of course much worse. Indeed. But it also has Eternalize of a three blue blue discard a card. So it's not. It's like the other Eternalize discard a card uncommon. It's not card advantage, but it lets you in the late game trade your worst card, a land or a low impact spell. To get a 4-4, four, four, and the 4-4 four, four getting to pump for plus one, minus one is, is more relevant than the 2-2. Two, two. Definitely. That, that's a scary – you know, that's one where you're like attack and they're like, oh, all right, well, I don't want to take seven, so I better do something about this thing. So hmm. I, I like Sinuous Striker. I would I would give it a, a B minus. I think I would always play this and be happy taking it like third pick. I have this, a B minus too. Yeah. This feels like a card that moves you into blue. Yeah, I like it. I like the cheaper – uh, eternalize on those. Uh, Spellweaver Eternal is next. It's one in a blue for a 2-1 zombie Naga wizard. In common, it's got prowess and afflict two. 
I like this card a lot more than I did on my first take. And that's one of actually one of the interesting things I, I find about doing multiple reviews because I do them, you know, every every day matters, right? In between. Yeah. And I did the blue review a couple days ago. And now after just, again, thinking about it more, looking at the cards, talking to people, I have a different context. I think if there's an aggressive blue deck spell, Wood of Eternal could really lay the beatdowns. Be, it could be kind of the, the default common to drop for that type of archetype. If you can, if, you, if this is attacking as a 3 2 a lot of the time, it's going to be great. And afflict creatures mean that. If you can get your opponent down to four or six, then they they add up really quickly, especially with all that incidental damage that we were talking about in mm-hmm. red. So, like, if your opponent's at four and you play a spell weaver eternal, they're effectively at two. Yes. There's no way around that unless yes. they kill it before you actually attack. Right, and there's just so or few decks that can do that over before. and over again. Right, like keep killing your creatures rather than blocking them. Yeah, and the fact that this has prowess means that there's a lot of ways to stack it up you know, the damage with it and, and it plays well with combat tricks. So I'm not saying I'm, I, I'm super high on spell with Returnal, but I think it actually could be a legit piece of a, of a good blue beat down deck. And I like it. I mean, I like it at C still. I'm it's not a C, right? Yeah. It, I was going to ask that, but, but still, I, I agree. It, it looks like a D or a D plus to me at first glance, but I think you're right. It, if people are able to turn creatures sideways and blue is part of that equation, then this thing becomes a very, very nice little two. If they're not, well, then it kind of falls off the cliff, I think. Um, strategic planning is next. Uh, just learned today this is a reprint. Uh, one on a blue. Of a very expensive Portal 3 Kingdoms card. Oh, yeah, very, very much so. Uh, so it's one in a blue for a sorcery at common. And it says, look at the top three cards of your library. Put one of them in your hand and the rest into your graveyard. Basically, you're spinning your wheels here. You're, you're spending two mana. You're not affecting the board at all. You're getting you're getting card selection. This is kind of like a better anticipate because it's – look, it's almost always better to put cards in your graveyard instead of on the bottom of your deck mm-hmm. because you have cards – you know, eternalize and more options with cards like Wander and Death. But this is still the kind of card that I would tend to avoid playing unless I didn't have a lot of low drops so I didn't think I was going to spend my turn two doing anything anyway or cared about spell counts. Yeah, this is again. I've mentioned it a few times during this review, but this is a classic. Looks like I'll play it, and I don't end up playing it very often. Type card. Yeah, which it looks like a D to me. Yeah, it's probably in the in the D range. You know, one one important thing we should note here that you just touched on that we should re, uh, reiterate again uh, in relation to Sierra of the Last Tomorrow and strategic planning about milling and how you were saying, well, you know, you don't. If you didn't actually mill them out, you didn't really get anywhere. And in fact, you probably did yourself a bit of a disservice. I was explaining this to somebody at a local shop the other day when we were talking about Seer the Last Tomorrow. And I said, look, if you could start the game by just taking half your library and putting it in your graveyard, you would just do that. And they're like, what? Like, I'm, you know, like, that's insane. And I'm like, no, you you just get like free eternalized cards. You might have that counter spell that, ca- you know, there's just like small incidental things. And so few games go to turn 13, 14, you know, to the point that you're actually getting decked that, you know, you, you'd probably just take that. And, and if it's 10 cards or whatever, that's fine. Like it, the number isn't important. But the point is, is that it's an advantage to start with some amount of cards in your graveyard from your deck. And I think that when you kind of get that around your brain, you know, cards like strategic plan, you can see they go up a little bit because you get to put a couple of cards in your yard. I, I don't know if I would start with half my deck in my graveyard. How far would you go? I mean, you'd take 10 well, cards, What right? if you mill, mill the good half, like your, your bombs? Are you right. know, you know, we're trying to teach <laughs> just derailing constantly. Uh, Striped River Winder. This card's sweet. <laughs> this is a six and a blue mm-hmm. for a five, five hex proof serpent at common. It has cycling blue. So this is a. I'm loving it. I wouldn't. I was gonna say bigger river serpent. It's just a more expensive river serpent, but you get hexproof instead of the drawback of uh, being only able to attack sometimes. Yeah. 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 This card's great. I mean, you don't have infinite room for this kind of nonsense, but the the one mana cyclers are pretty uh, unobtrusive. Like you just got to play mm-hmm. them a lot of the time, and a five five hexproof is an actual finisher. It really is. It's a very good card. Very good blocker to help stabilize the game and. And it can attack well too. So I like Stripe Riverwinder a lot. I mean, I still think it's like a C or a C plus. I was going to say C plus for it because of the cycling being just blue. You know, those cards really did kind of shine in the last set. The the single mana cyclers are so much better than the double. Yeah, I would still just give it a C, but I think that it is a fine card. I give it a the plus because of the artwork. It's like uh, old, yeah, old, old, it is old, pretty sweet. old school magic. Um, I like this next one. Uh, yeah, this card's good. Supreme Will. Mm. It's like normal Will with uh, sour cream and tomatoes. Um, it's, a, <laughs> it's tuna blue 
<laughs> it's it's an instant oh, uncommon. Everybody who's eaten too much Taco Bell in their life just is <laughs> like, oh no. <laughs> or they're hungry and they're, they're ordering Taco Bell. Yeah, right that's now. true. <laughs> it's tuna blue. It's uncommon. It's instant. It's uh, it's a split card. Uh, you choose one counter target spell unless its controller pays three, or look at the top four cards of your library, put one in their hand, and the rest in the bottom. So it's literally mana leak plus impulse. Mm-hmm. Which are both two mana spells, but you get the luxury of choosing between them for three mana. I like it. Oh, this card's great. And yeah. The reason it's great is three mana counters. It's not that they're in. Tr- it's not that they're bad when they work. When you counter, when you pay three mana and counter their four or five drop, or even their three drop, that is fine. Yes. Right. That is a fine card. The drawback, and we actually saw this pop up in the in the subreddit about cancel because during my draft videos, everyone else's draft videos, everyone else's streams, cancel just gets. Passed, bypassed without a second thought. No one even talks about it. The, the drawback of three mana counters is that when you leave three mana up for a counter and they don't play a card you can counter, they like spend their turn cycling or pass because they have an instant or whatever, you just lost three mana. You don't get it back. You did nothing. S- Supreme Will doesn't have that drawback. If, if you pass with this up and they don't play anything you want to counter, you can just cast it to, to get some card selection and that is fine. And it goes deep. I mean, we're looking at the top four cards. That's 10% of your total library that you get to see just with this one card. It's a lot. And, it, and it's going to be 10, you know, more than 10% of what's left as well. So uh, you, you can, you know, it, I think we've all had those type of decks that required a specific build around or maybe a bomb that you had. And, and this can actually dig you pretty deep into your library. So I think both sides look pretty good on this thing. Yeah, I, I, I'm a fan. And uh, I, I think that I, I will play this in. Basically, all my blue oh, decks. Oh, I know I think, you'll play it. Yeah, I think a really aggressive blue deck still might want this card because it's just a good way to spend your mana. Mm-hmm. Like if you're if you're playing a fast game and you can play like a two drop, a three drop, then leave this up. Like you're gonna stop them, and then late game it's still a fine card. So yeah, yeah. I, I like Supreme Will at B minus. I'm still not saying it's like you know a card I would take over like an aerial guide necessarily, but I think it's good. Okay, I like it at B minus too, and I was hoping you were gonna say B minus. Uh, Tragic lesson. Man, this is a beating of a artwork, by the way. Uh, two oh, and a blue for an instant at common. Draw two cards. This is an instant. Uh, draw two cards, then discard a card unless you return a land you control to its owner's hand. This is a weird one. It, it is. I so it's catalog. At, it's catalog with like flexibility because catalog is two and a blue instant. Draw two, discard a card. Mm-hmm. But catalog's not very good. It's just not a card you really want to play. Right. And getting to return a land is interesting because in the early game, that part is horrible. You, you, you if you cast this on turn three and return a land, like I don't know what's going on. Right. Well, I do. You're losing. Yeah, that's probably the case. Late game, it's that's like ne- negligible. Um, where this might fit is like a spells deck where you just want spells, and then discarding is actually not that bad because sometimes you just discard another spell and you're like happy about that. Yeah. Or or but, you trigger a discard trigger you know yeah, you you can trigger all the discard stuff by doing this i don't think this card's good and i think that you should generally not play it i so think so this, too tragic lesson looks like like a d minus to me i don't think it's an f i think you're, you're generally not going to harm your deck by putting this in it's just you don't have room for stuff like this yeah i was going to give it a d I, similar i mean it, it's just harsh because like you compare it to supreme will and it's i mean obviously it's, this is a common versus an uncommon but still it's just like it's it's laughable like supreme will so much better than that um Next card is called Unquenchable Thirst. It's one in a blue for an enchantment aura at common and enchants a creature. When it enters the battlefield, if you control a desert or if you have a desert in your graveyard, you tap the enchanted creature. So this is something you're going to be playing on your opponent's creature. Enchanted creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Enchanted <laughs> creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. I added a word there. So it, this is a containment membrane for two mana, but if you have oh, a you're desert, going, it, you're going deep. It, nobody remembers what containment membrane is. Yeah, this is basically this locks their, their their creature down, and if you have a desert, it it actually taps it to start the, to to kick things off. Yeah, because two or two mana tap a creature and it never untaps is a, is is very good. Very good, except if you just don't always get that with this. But this, if putting sometimes you have to put it on an untapped creature because you don't have a desert, and that ends up being pretty bad. Another thing that I well, actually you can also just put it on a tap creature. Yeah, and that's also fine. Yeah, uh, but you got hit by that once at that point. Um, yes. One thing that makes this a little worse is that there's just a lot of untap effects in the set because they work with exert. Mm-hmm. So if you play this and your opponent plays a dauntless Aven, yeah, like, I was, gonna, I was thinking of that exact thing. You just get embarrassed. So yeah. 
I think this card is fine if you're if you don't have any deserts in your deck, it's a more of a defensive card. I wouldn't want this in my aggressive decks. If you do have deserts, it's it's a passable card for sure. And you just have to be ready to slide it out. It's just going to be so bad in some matchups. Yeah, I think really pay attention to the colors that get those untap effects. The repeated ones are the ones that are the big problem. Because if they get to untap it once and then it gets tapped again, you know, you're not happy, but you could probably live with it. But if it's this type of thing where that Dauntless Save is going to be just basically making your unquenchable thirst just non-existent then then you're in a different world and this does not seem great you know this is this is a pretty typical blue attempt at removal some of these are better than others this one looks like it's on the lower end of the scale to me it's just not a great card where would you you know like what, what kind of grade would you give it i would give it like a d plus i think it's I think a card it's... that you probably prefer to not run that often uh and then you know, if you have deserts, it moves up into the C plus range. Like it is pretty good if, you know, if they, if they're not untapping it and you do have a desert, it's just a really good removal spell, right? It's just, that's a, kind of a lot to, to set up in case uh, either you do find yourself without a desert or they do have ways to untap. I, I like Unquenchable Thirst at C minus, I think. Okay. Yeah. I, so we're pretty not, close. I'm not super high on the card either. Right. Next one, Unsummon is back. Good old Unsummon, all the way going back to Alpha. I love it when they reprint cards from Alpha. Giant Spider, Unsummon. You I know, think it's Because there's so, so many cards you just can't anymore. Like Giant Growth, one green mana for plus three, plus three at instant speed. That's actually above right now. You just yep. probably won't see that very often. No, and we'll have to wait for Power Creep to catch up to that one. But yeah, Unsummon, blue, instant, common, return target creature to its owner's hand. And I talked earlier about uh, these type of effects and how I, I like them actually quite a bit these days in Limited. You can't go insane with them because they're not removal spells, so you don't get to just sub them in one for one where you would have a removal spell. But I really do appreciate having an effect like this in my deck, maybe even two of them. Um, and the key to it is to try to engineer a scenario where you can get your card back out of it. If somebody goes for an aura or a pump spell on their creature, or if you save your own creature from a removal spell um, or a, a bad combat scenario or any of those things, uh, you know, can get you a card worth of value back from your unsummon. And that's what you'd really like. What you don't want to do is just fire it off and just make your opponent just replay a creature. The unsummon really doesn't work that well in the long run because they just do. They're just like, okay, I'll just replay my creature. Go. And you're down a card and they're not. You, sure, you've gained some tempo. You got you bought yourself a little bit of time. But if you're not able to fully capitalize on that, you're just spinning your wheels. So l be patient with unsummon type cards. And if you are, I think that they're worth it. I, again, it's just name another you know spell in the whole set that only costs one mana that lets you interact with your opponent's creature. They're just not around. Right. They just don't print them like that anymore. Winds of Rebuke ended up being a solid main deck card. And exactly. And Unsummon is significantly better because one mana, yeah. like you said, is just so much less of a tax to leave up. So It really is. And yes, winds can hit non-creature spell uh, permanence, but you almost yeah. always hit creatures. Basically didn't come up. Uh, I like Unsummon at C+. A word of warning is that you don't want four in your deck. No, the right. second one already starts to lose value. The I third don't mind one like is two, gone. But like, yeah, once you get too many, that's just too many cards that don't uh, that leave you down a card. Unsummon is just good enough tempo that drawing like a good draw with one unsummon is great. A good draw, like a draw with three unsummons, is often not going to be good. You have too many cards that don't do enough. Now, if you so, have two Eternal of Harsh Truths, <laughs> go ahead, <laughs> yeah. take all the unsummons and play them, because <laughs> that is just a game plan that can actually work. So. Do you like uh, it at C plus? I do, C++? I do. I think that's exactly where it should be uh, for for such a cheap interactive spell. Last blue card is called Vizier of the Anointed. This is a neat one. It's kind of a a build around type card. Um, it's three and a blue for a two four human cleric. This is an uncommon, and it says when it enters the battlefield, you can search your library for a creature card with Eternalize or Embalm and put that card into your graveyard and then shuffle your library. And then it has a static ability that says. Whenever you activate an Eternalize or Embalm ability, draw a card. So this is cool. By itself, if you play this and then they kill it and then you Embalm whatever you got or Eternalize whatever you got, you're up a card. Mm -hmm. if, if they don't kill this and you do that, you're up two cards because you drew a card off the ability. That's right. And it also works with just other random Eternalize or Embalm creatures you have. So Yeah. You know, I, the, thing, the, the thing that stands out is that you might read this and say, okay, I need a whole bunch of Embalm. Like, right. I'm going to build an Embalm deck. No, you need, like, two or even one. Like, it'll go search the other one up out of your library. So, you know, the, the, this thing isn't really all about critical mass as it's just about having at least meet the requirement of one or two Eternalize and or Embalm creatures, which I think makes it a lot better. 
I think I would play this if I had one card to go get. And if, once you had two or more, yeah, you're, you're, it's just a great card. Yeah. I like it. I, I like it for the cheaper embalmed creatures too, but this one's also four. So it's not a big stretch to play this. Go get an uh, eternalized card for six. You know, play something on five and then eternalized draw card. And I like the stats two, four on a four is good enough, you know, uh, to, to be a decent blocker, hopefully, or a double blocker or whatever. So I like Vizier of the Anointed a lot. I just think it's a good card. Like, And, and I'm also confident in taking it early. Like I would take yeah. this third pick when I had no cards that went with it under the assumption that I can pick one up. Absolutely. And again, one or two is fine. And if you have more, you can great. go off with sacred cats. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. You really can. <laughs> um, I'm going to say B minus for Vizier of the Anointed. I just think yeah. you're going to be able to make it work. I like B minus for Vizier. Okay. Uh, that does it for blue. Blue looks really cool, but it, it had some issues in Amonkhet and we'll see if it can uh, maybe change its its tone a little. Uh, you mentioned that you thought it might be a little bit more aggressive and we'll, we'll see if that pans out. Some nice tempo stuff here. Yeah. Blue often ends up in a mixed bag sort of thing where Wh- it's aggressive it cards here. Don't, don't work with its defensive cards. Yeah. So we'll see. Like Seer of the Last Tomorrow alongside aggressive cards is just not a combo. So we'll, right. we'll see how that works out. Yeah, we'll see. All right, Black. The first card up is uh, nice and aggressive. It's a Cursed Horde. It's a three and a black for a three, three zombie at uncommon. And you can pay one and a black to have target attacking zombie gain indestructible until end of turn. And that is count itself if you want to. So it helps you uh, keep the damage flowing where if you have, you know, you can attack with two or three zombies, you can give well, one or two of them uh, indestructible or maybe even more. What, what's the concept we would use to describe this? Uh, threat of activation. Right, right. That's what it is. I'll explain it later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this card is actually a poster poster child for that because mm-hmm. what's going to happen is you're just going to attack with a cursed horde or or you're like cursed minotaur, a three two menace from M1 Cat, and your opponent's going to look at their board of two and three toughness creatures and be like, I guess I can't block. I'll take it, and then you're just going to play whatever you were going to play that turn. Right. Yeah. So card solid. I get, it, it is a zombie itself, so you get that effect too. It just seems very good. I would play this card as the only zombie in my deck. Yeah. I think it's fine. It's yeah. just got decent stats. It can attack well. And of course, it's great in a zombie deck. So that leads me to think it's like probably a B minus. I think so too. Curse Horde, B minus. Uh, Bane Whip Punisher is next. This card's a beating. It's two and a black for a 2 2 human warrior at uncommon. And when it enters the battlefield, you may put a minus one, minus one counter on target creature. You can uh, pay black and sacrifice it to destroy target creature that has a minus one, minus one counter on it. Bane Whip Punisher is great. Wow, this card's great. So if it didn't have the second ability, the sacrifice ability, if it was two and a black for a two, two that puts a minus one, minus one counter on a creature, I'd always play it. Yeah, that'd be great. Picks off X ones and just weakens their creatures. The fact that you can also sack it to kill whatever you weakened or whatever has a minus one, minus one counter from your other effects. And you can do that at instant speed just makes this card fantastic. Yeah, Um, I think it's really good. At the very worst, it's two black, black destroy target creature and you get a chump block out of the deal. Yeah. It's great with like cards like Wander and Death that will get creatures back from your graveyard. So. Yeah, and the ceiling's significantly higher. Like you said, you could play it, pick off a small creature, and then incidentally have something big with just a single minus one, minus one counter on it later in the game and kill that too. Yep. It, it's a beating. Uh, this looks like a B plus to me. Me too. I, I think Bane with Punisher is going to be a uh, take it early type card. And I got to tell you, you know, given how the format played out, in Amonkhet and how things look like they may be shaping up here, this is the type of card that can really uh, stop an, an aggressive start. So I like that. Uh, next card is called Carrion Screecher. It's three and a black for a 3-1 zombie bird at common, and it's got flying. So three this is a lot worse than even initiate, which ended up being kind of medium. Yeah, and this is way worse. I mean, it, it gets <laughs> oh, yeah. zombie as a it does get zombie, card type, but... but eh. The other one, even Initia did too sometimes, so I don't know. I don't know if that's uh, enough to carry it. <laughs> probably not. Um, look, the thing that I do like about it is that it's in a color that tends to play out much more aggressively than blue did. So putting up an evasive three-powered threat for four mana is a way to push through some damage and maybe uh, you know push an aggressive deck over the top. Um, the downside, of course, is, are, are many. Um, you know, It's so fragile. It just won toughness. And uh, and really just can't interact in combat in a meaningful way without dying. So, you know, at four mana, this is this is not a great card. It's um, a three power flyer. 
But it is a three power Who's flyer that? in a color that tends to want to get people dead, and it is a zombie, which does matter. Uh, it really, you know, you're. I think you're going to play this it. card a decent amount. I just, I yeah. don't think it's great. And I, what I think, if you start with carrying creature in your deck, which is acceptable, side it out if they have lots of ways to punish one toughness creatures. So, you know, sure. if, if if you end up seeing like just multiple ways to deal one or or put a one counter on something, then. You just don't want this card in your deck. Yeah, or if they have 1-1 one, one flyers or whatever. Yeah, I, I would assume it's like a C, though. Yeah, it looks like a C to me. Uh, what does Doomfall do? I like this one, too. This is another one of the, the modal cards. It's two and a black, sorcery, uncommon. Choose one. Target opponent exiles a creature he or she controls. Or target opponent reveals his or her hand. Choose an online card from it and you and exile. You choose an online card from that. Okay, so, so two completely different things. So these are two effects that I think are are fairly poor, right? You're not going to mm-hmm. play edict effects where your opponent gets to choose what they what they lose in terms of creatures, and you're not going to play three mana, look at their hand, and take a card. But having both on the same card makes this a card I think I would main deck most of the time. You think Just, so? Two two bad tastes that taste great together. Well, the thing is, an edict effect when it's good, it's really good. Yeah. When when all they have out is a four four, and a card is great. It's just a straight premium removal spell. And when your opponent has five cards in hand and you can afford to exile a card from their hand, that's also good too. You get to see what they're going to play. You get to take their best card. I think that these two cards together combine well enough. Like basically edict effects are fine. Like if you play this card on turn three, it's going to be fine. It's going to kill one of their early plays and that's just acceptable. Mm -hmm. And when you draw this late game and they have a lot of crappy creatures in play, they're still going to have two or three cards in their hand most of the time and you're going to get to take one. So... I like Doomfall. I, I'm not like taking it early or go, going nuts over it, but I think in like a, the average mid range deck, you should pretty much always play it, which kind of indicates that it's like a C to C plus to me. This is a very difficult card to grade, no, or just to grade even it. just to evaluate. But I just did that. Though. Well, I meant correctly. Oh, yeah. I don't think that's what this survey was about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. I mean, I, yeah, I, I think what you said makes sense. I think it falls somewhere in the middle where you're never thrilled necessarily. Also, I will note that it does seem to get pretty bad in the extreme late game where it's, you know, an edict effect tends to be pretty bad at that point because they often have expendable creatures and where they're often top decking or out of cards. So it does lose value in the very late part of the game, which I think is relevant. Um, but yeah, it's like probably a C minus or a C. I mean, it seems fine. I like I like having that choice. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll be willing to be talked down to a C, I guess. All right. Uh, Grizzly Survivor. What is What does this guy do? Uh, two and a black for a 2-3 Minotaur Warrior at common. Whenever you cycle or discard a card, it gets plus 2, plus 0 until end of turn. So it's a Hecma Sentinels that gets plus 2, plus 0 instead of plus 1, plus 1. Unfortunately, I think that's worse. That's worse for sure. Not going up in toughness means your opponent can attack into it with a 3-3 three, three and just know that worse comes to worst you trade. Yeah, same thing on blocks. Yeah. So I, I'm uh, I'm not impressed with Grizzly Survivor, though I think it's playable. I mean, a blue-black cycling deck, it can hit for a decent amount of damage. I. I would end up uh, probably giving Grizzly Survivor like a C minus. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to give it a D plus. I think this card's a little below the curve. It's also not a zombie or anything like that. So I'll, I'll say that a D plus for Grizzly Survivor. Kenra Eternal is a nice one though. What, what is this? What does Kenra Eternal uh, do? One in a black for a two two zombie jackal warrior at common and has afflict one. So two mana two two zombie was playable as we saw with Miasmic Mummy where the discard was. Maybe slightly better for the zombie decks, but yeah, just, but annoying still. Yeah, it's still not really like particularly, uh, you know, impressive. But it was a, it was a two drop zombie, so you you just played it. And this is a zombie. Afflict one is a nice little bit of upside. So I like C plus for Kenra Eternal. It's not I, a I think really exciting card. You're just yeah, gonna play it a lot. Though. I like it too. I mean, the, the fact that it's a zombie is gonna push it over the top, and then uh, it's just gonna be the sort of the default common black two drop. You're gonna see it all the time. So C plus for Kenra Eternal. Uh, speaking of default black cards, here's Lethal Sting. This is two and a black for a sorcery at common. It says, as an additional cost to cast Lethal Sting, put a minus one, minus one counter on a creature you control, but its effect, destroy target creature. Just dead. I like Lethal Sting. Yeah. You're, you're going to play this card in any deck that has a decent amount of creatures. This is not the kind of card you can play like a nine creature deck, but if you have like 13, 14 creatures, especially some that have two toughness, so you're not just killing your own creature then, yeah, Lethal Sting is, is, is fine. I mean, it does what you need it to do. And right. it works with Proven Combatant. It's a pretty sick combo. With which one? The 1-mana one, 1-1 one, one with Eternalize uh, of 6. 
Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I guess it does combo off pretty hard with that, doesn't it? <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, you kind of had me at three mana destroy target creature. Like, yes, the downside's real, but that's that's very, very powerful. Kills anything you need to get killed. So I like that. I think lethal sting you're going to see all the time. Um, I think it's a B minus. I, 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 it might just end up being a B, being a B or whatever, but the minus minus one counter does count. I mean, that, that's a real cost. Uh, you know, if you don't have any creatures, you can't even cast this. So yeah, it, it, it is a real cost. I, I like B minus for lethal sting, but it is the kind of card that doesn't stack well because when one's dead, they're all going to be dead. And if you have a two, two and you have two of these in your hand, it's not as good, Right. but I still think I, I would take this card fairly high. Me too. Uh, what about Liliana's defeat? Uh, it's, one black mana for a sorcery done common. Destroy target black creature or black planeswalker. And if that permanent was a Liliana planeswalker, her controller loses three life. So, so in our for our purposes, black sorcery, destroy target black creature. So this is comparable to Chandra's defeat and Gideon's defeat. I think a little worse because it's sorcery speed. I think Chandra's defeat's the best one because <laughs> that's just deal five. Uh, Gideon's defeat requires it to be attacking or blocking, which means you can't take out a blocker. This can take out a creature before they block, but it is sorcery. Still, I think it's about the same as them in that it's a sideboard B. Like yeah. you'll take it over, over a lot of mid-range cards, and it'll be great when you side it. In. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. See, th these all seem fine to bring it out of the board against the right thing, but <clears throat> not main deck. Uh, next card, not super impressive. It's called Lurching Rot Beast. It, it can't be impressive with that name. That no. Name just it can't be good yeah and and it lives up to its name it's a it's, uh, th three and a black for a four two zombie beast at common with cycling black yeah i mean i do think the card is playable yeah i do too i mean anything that cycle, has one mana zombie. cycling i'm fine yeah but it is really unimpressive on the battlefield yeah, it, it's the sort of thing that when you cycle it you're not like oh wow i got paid off because it's just a cycling card and then you cast it you're not really paid off either so it's kind of like desert ceridon which was ended yep. up being a card i didn't play much because it wasn't good to cast. And you're, you want your cycling cards to at least be good to cast, whereas like Winged Shepherd was. Exactly. And this really isn't. Uh, the two toughness is just a deal breaker. It just trades for too many much, much cheaper, much smaller creatures. So uh, like you said, the floor on it can't be too low. It's still probably like a C minus. But I, my gut is that Lurching Rot Beast isn't going to be – isn't going to see a ton of play just because it's simply just too bad on the battlefield. Uh, yeah, more, I, what, do you, what do you think? I agree. I think that some zombie decks will maybe be a little higher on it or some cycling decks, but mm -hmm. for the most part, it's just filler. Yep. Uh, Marauding Bone Slasher. What does this one do? I like this one. This is two and a black for a 3-3 three, three zombie minotaur at common, and it can't block unless you control another zombie. Oh, yeah. I like that a lot. It's it's just a good-sized zombie. It can attack well. It not blocking just doesn't matter in a lot of decks, and in some of the, in a lot of the decks you play, you're just going to have other zombies. So three mana, 3-3 three, three in black is... Better than you might think because yeah, if you're used to beating. three mana three three and green, like I think this is better than the green three three, even though the green three three just doesn't have a drawback. Mm -hmm. I but think this one's a zombie and in a more aggressive that, color, exactly. Both those things. So yeah. I, I like Marauding Bone Slasher at C, plus, and I think it's just one of the better black commons. I agree. I, I think you're going to be attacking with it for the most part anyway, and often you'll be able to block. Uh, next is called Merciless Eternal. This is two and a black for a two two zombie cleric. This is an uncommon. It's got Afflict 2 uh, on a 2-2. Two -two. So it says, and it also has an activated ability. Two and a black, discard a card. Merciless Eternal gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. And here we are again. It's a it's 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 sort of a damned if they do, damned if they don't type scenario, right? Uh, they are highly incentivized to want to block your Merciless Eternal right away because it has Afflict 2. And if you get hit, if you... If you uh, take too many hits from one of these, then the afflict thing really starts to become an issue. It's only a 2-2 on its surface, so you're like, cool, I want to block it. But it has the ability to get huge. Uh, you know, two and a black discard a card is a hefty price, but it becomes a 4-4, four, four, you know, until end of turn. And that's just going to be very difficult to, to profitably block. So Merciless Eternal it just puts them in an awkward position where... If they do decide, okay, fine, I'm just going to go ahead and take it, then you can start piling on extra damage, and it's a lot. You know, plus two, plus two until it turns, no joke. It, it does a lot of damage, and because you don't have to use it very often, then you're you're just fine chipping away for two until you're not, until you start, like, just loading up on it. Exactly. And then, of course, the afflict sort of looms heavy on your opponent at that point, too. I think the card's good. 
<clears throat> I just think it it really uh, presents your opponent with a, a handful of not great decisions that they have to make. And anytime you get to do that, that's usually a good thing. Um, you can even block, you know, you can just be like, go. And, you know, if, if they see that you have a potential 4-4 sitting there, they're going to have a hard time attacking into you too. So I think the card's just good. Yeah, I, I like Merciless Eternal. I, I, I was going to give it a B minus. I, yeah, I really I like do B, think it's good. I like B minus. Yeah, I don't think it's like one of the premiere and comments, but it's really good. Uh, Moaning Wall is next. It's two and a black for an 05 zombie wall at common. It's got defenders, you might imagine. And it also has cycling for two. This kind of encapsulates all the things that I didn't want to do in Amonkhet, which is block and cycle for two. Yeah, I'm not really high on Moaning Wall. Uh, I think that it's just going to end up being kind of bad either direction. And it just looks like filler. If you really want cyclers or you really need early plays, I guess this qualifies. But I, I'm I'm not super high on this. I, I would give this like a D. I give it a D as well. Also, the fact that it's a zombie is not super relevant because the zombie deck is an aggressive deck. So it doesn't count there. Uh, next one is called Rosiketh's Right. It's three black black for a sorcery at Uncommon. It says, search your library for a card and then put that card into your hand. Then shuffle your library. Does that remind you of anything? And uh, it's got cycling for black. So, so uncommon tutor. You know the proper procedure with this, right? No. What is it? Anytime you hard cast it, you have to check the top card to see if that was what you wanted. And you can just <laughs> that is not correct, man. Oh, yeah. You shouldn't think of it like that. And then if if too often it beca- it looks like it would have been the top card, then just start, start cycling it. Because <laughs> you could have just done it a lot yeah. easier for one mana. <laughs> Oh, that's really funny. Uh, You know, we don't usually play cards like this in limited because they're so conditional and slow. Uh, And traditionally, this effect, uh, you know, in in modern times costs four mana rather than five. Um, But the fact that we get cycling on top of it means that they've bumped it up another notch to five. Um, Are we playing this and and how often are we just going to cycle it away anyway? I am not looking to play this card very often. Unless I care about the actual cycling part, which case the card becomes good because if you have room for this or you have a lot of cycling triggers, uh, it is powerful in the late game, especially if you have like particularly good cards to get. But you really can't play games of limited where you spend five mana to get a card. Like right. It's just too often that you get punished too hard for that. Yeah. So I, I don't think I play this very often, but I mean, any card of cycling for one mana can't be that bad. So I think it's like a C minus, but I just don't think you'll have room for it very often. Maybe a D plus. Yeah, I'd say D plus for Razaketh's right. It's just so slow on on both ends. It's just a lot of wheel spinning. Uh, Next card's called Ruin Rat. It's one and a black for a 1-1 rat at common. It's got death touch. And when it dies, you exile target card from an opponent's graveyard. So two mana, one, one death touch. And then maybe it'll pick off an eternalized card or something along those lines. So we've been talking about blocking being difficult uh, coming into the set and and us, you know, starting to see that it might stay that way. Um, we don't mean the ability to say I block. It just we, – we mean profitable blocks, blocks that actually, right. you know, keep you alive. And, and does Rune Rat circumvent some of the, the bad blocks that we've been seeing? It does. Like for example, uh, Hooded Brawler, right, from Amonkhet. This can mm-hmm. block it because a 5-4 doesn't get by a death touch. 1-1, one, one, but – you got like Oketra's Avenger from this set, the three one that, be, that prevents all damage when you exert it, yeah. or you know Gust Walker, or oh, yeah. uh, any of the menace creatures. Yeah. Now one one Death Touchers still aren't like you know a plus at blocking. So I I think Ruin Rat is fine. I would play it in like most mid ranger control decks, but I'm not thrilled about it. It looks like a C to me. Yeah, I think it's just a, a, a solid C. And don't forget the trigger. By the way, I had a chance to play with this card, and uh, it's easy to forget that trigger. Uh, next card called is called Scrounger of Souls. This is one I'm really interested in, Luis. It's four and a black for a, a horror at common. It's a three four with lifelink. So this is uh, the same as the you know some nonsense paladin in one of the core sets that was four and a mm-hmm. white for lifelink. That card wasn't very good. This card also doesn't look very good to me. Basically, if you have a lot of ways to pump it, I could see it being reasonable, but it's just not that big, and uh, the five drop slot usually doesn't need a whole lot of help. Yeah, you know, the thing that I like about it that makes me interested in it is that lifelink on a relatively big 3-4, a decent blocker and a good attacker, 
does seem a lot more relevant than normal. I've been mentioning that I've been looking for ways to gain life in the set, you know, to help counteract afflict and incidental damage sources. And I'm wondering if Scrounger of Souls is our champion. You know, is is this is this card our hero? Is this the one that's going to lead us, uh, you know, from a game where we've gotten off to a slow start, but now we're stable, and now Scrounger of Souls is our way to come back to the point where we can't, you know, realistically lose the game, or is it too slow for that? Right, because it is a five mana creature, uh, you know, that takes a while to get going. Um, but the turn you play it, I mean, a three four life linker, that's hard to attack into if you're playing an aggressive deck for sure. I think that we might see this see a little more use than than you might expect, but I still don't think the card is great. I, I think you're not going to take it very high. I don't think you're going to play it all that often. So where do you have it at? Like C a minus. C C minus. Yeah, I was going to say C plus. I think that. This is the I I think this is the environment where Scrounger of Souls is going to shine. I just think that, that that's the type of card that right. you're going to uh, play. I I I I'm I don't big on Life it, Link. We'll, I'm big we'll on see, Life we'll Link. We'll see where we end up. All right. Yeah, you got you know, Scrounger of Souls at C plus. C plus. I have it at C minus. Yeah, we'll see how it does. Um, Torment of Scarabs. What, what does this one do? This is three in a black uh, for an aura curse at uncommon. You enchant your opponent and. That player loses three life at the beginning of their upkeep unless they sacrifice a non-land permanent or discards a card. Nope, I'm out. Nope, this card is uh, an F. Basically, you put this on your opponent and they're going to pay three life a few times then start sacking lands or discarding garbage cards. And that's just not a good card. Right, right? And, and to the people who think, well, that's not that bad. Remember, you spent four mana and an entire card to not do much. If they're beating you down, you didn't do anything, right? Uh this is a huge cost, a card out of your hand and, and the four mana is a big, big cost in an aggressive format. So yeah, I, I would I would give Torment of Scares an F. Anytime you give your opponent this many choices and this many different types of uh, resources to, to whittle away, they're just going to do the one that doesn't matter for that game and kill you while you sit there and stare at your, your curse. So yeah, I don't like it. I like F for Torment of Scarabs. On the other hand, Torment of Venom is two I black can black. get behind this one. Yeah, two black black for an instant at common. Put three minus one minus one counters on target creature. Its controller loses three life unless he or she sacrifices a, another non-land permanent or discards a card. This card's great because four mana for three minus one minus one counters on one creature is a card you should just always play. Yeah, instant and speed. Yep. Got a little upside. So uh, I'm a pretty big fan of Torment of Venom. I think this is just probably the best black common. I think so too. Uh, I would give it a B minus. I would too. I actually just give it a straight B. I think this is going to be the you know one of the uh, better removal spells in the format. And you know just to clarify, the difference here is yeah, your opponent also gets a choice on whether they lose three life or sacrifices another non land permanent or discards a card. So they have a couple of choices to make there. And you think, well, didn't you just say that they get that choice? Yes, that's true. Except for that, that's pure gravy. Right, that that extra ability is just bonus on this card. The reason you're playing it is for the three minus one minus one counters. That's the important part. And hey, if if you're gonna tack on, you know, some they lose three life or they have to do something that they'd rather not do, I'll take it. It's just you don't want to play cards where that's the only effect. I like B for Torment of Venom. You said B right, minus I'm, or B. You're gonna. Come I'm up fine. With? I'm fine with B. It's just, right. This is a premium common, and you're gonna take it. Right. Uh, Vile manifestation. One in a black for a zero four creature horror at uncommon it gets plus one plus zero for each card with cycling in your graveyard and it also has cycling itself cycling two it's so basically this is, tarmogoyf right just straight up well it's the cycling enigma drake right yes down uh, on the ground but, but it doesn't have flying is <laughs> yeah. the problem so i think it's a playable card in a blue black cycling deck or a black whatever cycling deck but i'm not really going nuts for it it's because it because it's cycling itself, it's fine. And if it's consistently like a two four or a three four in the like mid game, that's okay. And then once it hits the late game, it becomes a six four. That is pretty good, but it's kind of hard to imagine stacking up that many cycling cards. It really is. Like, what does your hand look like if you've cycled six times in a game? You know, just to get your your six four or whatever. It's probably all lands. <laughs> it's all lands, right? So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think the card's fine. I mean, I, I certainly would never say it's unplayable, but I, I think that the times when you're really like, wow, Vile Manifestation are going to be uh, pretty rare. I don't think they're going to come up that often. Uh, I, I would say it's like a C. Like, I just, I think this card's like, maybe it's a C plus, maybe it's a C. I would give Vile Manifestation a C. I think it's just really hard to make this card just like insane. 
I think it's a C, but I think that in the decks that want it, it's just it's going to be a card you're happy with. So that, I think like, so too. Yeah, it kind of me- makes it feel like a build around C plus, which is pretty close to a C. Right. Uh, next is without weakness. It's one and a black for an instant at common. It says target creature you control gains indestructible until end of turn, and it also has cycling for two mana. Yeah, it's a reasonable combat trick. It doesn't buff your creature at all, so it's not like supernatural stamina where you can yeah. take out a bigger creature than they expected. But it cycles if it's bad. It's it's a much worse Jiro's Resolve, right, from M1 Cat? Way worse. No so untap, cost double. Twice as much, it doesn't Ugh. untap. Ugh. I think this, this card's like a D plus. I'll tell you what, it's certainly not without weakness. Uh, I think it's a D. I just think it's a card that you'll play occasionally, and it'll go up uh, for decks that care about cycling. But just on its own, it's a pretty mediocre trick. Yeah. I'm not a big fan. Uh, all right, last black card is called Wretched Camel. Look at that guy. He, he's mad. He's pretty gnarly. He this really is. is. <laughs> and he's showing you. Uh, one and a black for a 2-1 zombie camel at common. So this is of of, of note here. We're, this is another two-drop zombie at common here. Remember, we've got the Kenra Eternal as well. So, you know, these are starting to really add up. Um, when, it, when it dies, if you control a desert or if there's a desert in your yard, target player discards a card. This card's pretty good. Yeah. If okay. you want a two drop or you want a zombie, you know, two drop or zombie, then uh, you, <laughs> you, 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 you'll, you'll play this card. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, and if you have deserts in your deck, then it becomes, I think, actually a good card. Yeah, I, I would, think so, too. If you have two deserts in your deck, I'd just always play this card. I think so, too. And 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 the zombie thing matters. Uh, you know, we, we've seen from, from other colors, right, uh, you know, cards that care about zombies, specifically in white. Uh, we saw some, and, and these all really do add up. Remember remember Mummy Paramount, the 2-2 two, two for one and a white? Yeah, you know, and it, it gets pumped for zombie. You know, this is the type of thing that can really help you get to critical mass on the number of zombies. And like you said, you throw a random desert or two, and all of a sudden the card becomes actually quite good. I, I think it's a C. Like, I, I don't think this is like an exciting card. But if you have deserts, it, it definitely gets bumped up into the C-plus range. Yeah, I like C-plus for uh, Wretched Camel. I just like Wretched Camel, too, because obviously... Okay, that's it for black. Lots of zombies. Yeah, zombies. Not, not as many zombie build arounds, though. No, there's fewer payoffs in black, but you're going to hit critical mass on zombies if you want to. Remember the Accursed Horde, the Kenra Eternal, the Carrion Screecher? Those were all zombies. The Merciless Eternal is a zombie. There's the 3 3 for 3 that's a zombie. There's even the crappy uh, Lurching Rot Beast, which I don't think you'll play that much. And that's a lot of zombies at common. So yeah, you're going you're gonna to see these around and it's going to be a real thing. All right, so we've got a few more cards to go here. Uh, some colorless, uh, some artifact cards and some lands, and then we will be on our way here. I don't think we have any more gold cards, do we? Nope. No, because we already covered them all uh, in the initial section. So uh, our first artifact is called Crook of Condemnation, and it is two mana for an artifact that's uncommon. And it has two activated abilities. The first one is one, tap it, exile target card from a graveyard. And the other one is one, and exile it to exile all cards from all graveyards. This is an F. It is yeah, a, you're not doing this. Even, you even sideboard, right? But yeah. There's, no, there's not enough graveyard stuff to ever side this in. It doesn't replace no. itself. There's no draw a card on it anywhere. So. Right. I am off it. I will condemn it to being an F. Yeah, it's an F. Um, next is called, excuse me, it's called Dagger of the Worthy. It's two mana for an equipment. This is also an uncommon. The equip cost is two. And of course, that's where we really uh, focus our attention when we talk about equipment. And this is right there, right? Like if either of these numbers was one higher, specifically the equip cost, I would be kind of just like, no. And as it stands, equip two is like, okay, I'm listening, but you really need to impress me, Dagger of the Worthy. And this is what it gets. The equip creature gets plus two, plus zero, which actually does impress me that that's a big power bump and it has afflict one. I, I kind of like it. I'm actually like, I'm on board for this. Like the, so the it's cost a, it's is, a tor- re- it's a ahead. torch gauntlet that you never played, but mm-hmm. it, it gets afflict one. Yeah. And I think in an aggressive set like this, you know, making it so that you equip this up to a creature that has lost its luster on the board and you just send it in. And it's going to trade for anything that blocks it for the most part, right? Unless they have, you know, 6-6 six, six or something like that. And if it does, they take a damage too. And then you move it over to something else and do it again. 
And I think that, you know, this is going to pull its weight in an aggressive deck enough that the two power plus the fact that even if they do end up trading off for a bunch of small creatures, your the afflict really does start to add up quickly. And it, this can be a late game finisher. I talked earlier about the incidental damage primarily from afflict, but from other cards as well. This is a repeat source of that. If, if you can get your opponent down to five life, if they have, you know, six five fives with defender on the board, meaning that, you know, you're just never getting through those, Dagger of the Worthy is a legitimate win condition. You just keep sending creatures in and don't care if they die. And uh, and and the fact that if the creature can actually hit, it's going to hit for a lot more makes it pretty good. Now, this is still a little clunky, right? Two to cast, two to equip is not, you know, a sleek, efficient equipment spell. So I'm not super high on it, but I do think it's worth the mana and the card that you invest in it. Mm, I do not think this card is worthy. I, I think that you're going to spend a little too much mana. I think that the games where you you have time for this are are not going to be as frequent as, as you're, what you're describing. I don't think the card's unplayable. I just don't think it's very good. And I, I, think, I just think it's your late game card for an aggressive yeah. deck. That's what I, I, mean, I, I view guess, it as I, that. I guess Horned Kopesh ended up being pretty reasonable in mm -hmm. Amonkhet. This card looks a little... It's clunkier. It's, it's clunkier. It is more powerful. Way more powerful. I, I, I think that you're going to want a lot of evasive creatures or a lot of fodder, a lot of proven combatants before you really get Dagger of the Worthy in there. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think you would put this in a normal red-black deck with a decent curve. I don't think that you would put this in like hmm, a green-white deck with a decent curve. Because I think that those cre the creatures are just so good now that adding to plus two plus O oh is just not worth spending two plus two. No, yeah. that's that's interesting. I haven't thought of it. Like, definitely, I agree with the green white. The the black. I, I don't know. It does stack, right? Like, if if a creature hat, like if I put this on a Kenra Eternal, it I just get two instances of afflict one, right? Definitely. Yeah, I think. Okay, uh, it it so. does. Um, so so where do we want to put it? Uh, you know, like I think it is pulling its weight. You think it it has a little further to go. Uh, I, like I said, I, I'm not excited about it. I just think that it you like you think it's a C plus. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, I do. I think it's a C minus. I think okay. that it's playable, but it's just not a card you're like hyped about. Okay, let's uh, let's wait and find out. Uh, next is Graven Abomination. Three mana for a three one horror. It is common, and it says uh, whenever Graven Abomination attacks, exile target card from defending player's graveyard. What? The thing I like most and least about this card is it looks like the red dragon, like that uh, famous piece of art, and it's a little creepy. But well, I'm just off it. I uh, don't know what the red dragon is, and I don't like Graven Abomination. <laughs> I give them both an F. <laughs> this guy's obviously not an actual F. It's not an F. It's like a D. No. Yeah, I think it's a D minus. Like I, I think a three one for three is just also not X ones tend to be pretty bad. So yeah, they're terrible. I think this card's awful. Don't play it unless you absolutely have to. Um, oh, Manolith is back. Our old yeah. buddy Manolith. Three mana artifact at common that taps for a mana of any color. This card seems pretty bad to me. I, I just, just I does not look good. like a, a three color format. And ramping from three mana to five mana is just not generally that valuable, especially in this format. It looks like there's a lot of just good two and three and four drops. So I know. It's uh, so sad because this is a great card. It's, or, you know, it's not a great card, but this is a card that you can play in limited and it does the, the thing that it does pretty darn well and it's colorless. So any color pair can pick it up. But I agree. I just, I'm, I'm gun shy, man. I, I'm just, you know, I'm coming off of not being able to block and not being able to play cards like Manolith and, and actually survive. And uh, I wouldn't be shocked if this, if this format was very hostile to Manolith as well. All right. That, that, that leads me to think it's like a D. It's a D. Yeah. Um, Sunset Pyramid. This is uh Two mana for an artifact. It's uncommon. And it says, Sunset Pyramid enters a battlefield with three brick counters on it. So this one comes with three bricks. You can pay two mana, tap it, and remove one of those brick counters to draw a card. Hello. And you can also uh, ignore the whole brick thing and just pay two mana, tap it, to scry one. I'm, I'm kind of digging this card. I'm kind of interested on this, yeah. So it's a draw three for a combined total of eight mana, which... right. That's not great. That's awful. But it leaves behind two tap scry one, which is actually, I think, a decent card to, to have once you're at a stage in the game where you've used this three times because you'll have hit your land drops and Definitely. probably have time to do it. You can't just put this in any deck, but in like a mid-range or control deck, it feels like you'll beat up on other slower decks with it. I think so too. And, you know, the fact that you get to break this up, you know, it's not just eight mana, right? We would never play that, but it's two, 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 and two. And you can skip it whenever you want. Like you can just not 
activate it if you need to just affect the board that turn and leave it for later. Yeah, it's a pretty low investment, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is slow. It is very concerning in a, in what could be a pretty fast format. But I agree. I think that this, you know, look, it's not like we we talk about a fast format because you have to respect the fact that you might face the fast deck, but you don't always. You just don't. Like there's plenty of games where it's your mediumish deck versus their mediumish deck, and a card like Sunset Pyramid does very nicely. Sure, if you face down, you know, the red white deck, a Sunset Pyramid's just too slow, and you might even want to sideboard it out. But, you know, against uh, against any of these slower decks, this is a type of card that can really get you far ahead. And, you know, you can do this on your upkeep, the scry, and and start manipulating your draw step uh, pretty significantly, um, you know, in the late part of the game when you can afford the mana for it. So I like Sunset Pyramid. I, I think it's a good card. I do. I just think it's a good card. Well, I like it too. I I mean, I'm giving it like a C or a C plus because yeah, I like it, 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 it's like, I like the flexibility. It, I like it at C plus and think that you just have to pick your spots with it. You just can't jam it in every deck. But I think even like a low curve aggressive deck, this could be a way to refill to could win be. a late game. Yeah, you, you can't yeah. afford too many slots like that, but you could afford one. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah just one. <laughs> yeah, just the one. <laughs> I, I like Sunset Pyramid at C+. Yeah, I like that too. Uh, Traveler's Amulet, another reprint. This is uh, one mana for an artifact at common, and you can pay a mana and sacrifice it to search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, and put it in your hand in the shuffle. Yeah, it's there's not a, it's a two man incentive. away. Yeah, Ugh. not a huge incentive to be running this card just because you're again not playing three colors. And I think if you're playing two colors, you don't really want to pay two mana to go get a land, even if it's one and one. Mm -hmm. so you really don't. You, you could I, die. <laughs> I'm just not. I'm just not into this card. I think Traveler's Amulet is is a D unless you have particularly harsh mana restrictions or are playing three colors. Right. And, you know, this is, by the way, a good signpost for for the way that, I mean, there's there's been sets where this is just a totally, like, it replaces a basic, you know, because you just can fix your mana. I mean, I'm just not in that world. Uh, last artifact is called Wall of Forgotten Pharaohs. It is two mana for a 0-4 defender. Uh, it's an artifact creature wall at common, and you can tap it. To have Wall of Forgotten Pharaohs deal one damage to target player, but you can only do it if you have a desert or a desert in your graveyard. So this is the Vent Sentinel of Deserts? <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> of a sorts. Uh, I'm not, I, I love Vent I'm not a big, I'm not a big fan of this. Like, I don't think 04 is going to block all that well, and I think the desert control deck just seems kind of unrealistic. So yeah. <laughs> it looks like a... Like a D minus to me. I love the desert control deck though. Maybe it's a thing, but yeah, whatever. I, I would give Wall of Forgotten Pharaohs a D minus. It just doesn't look good. Like, I don't know, really know what we're doing. I, the only hope we have is that it is a common. So maybe you can do it. The thing that turns me off to it is that, again, an 04, at least in the last set, just was not a good enough blocker. And when you combine the fact that there's still those cards and also now Afflict is a thing, Zero powered blockers just look way worse, right? You're like block your Kenner Eternal, like yeah, sure, take one anyway. It's just like man, I'm not even. Oh yeah, flicked even just this card's just an F. I'm yeah, all, I'm it just sucks. It. Yeah, flicked really screws over these type of cards. Sorry, Wall of Forgotten Pharaohs, but uh, you are exactly that. All right, uh, that leaves us with a few lands, and then we're going to call this thing. Um, first one is uh, part of a cycle, so we're just going to cover all five of these in one shot. It's called Desert of the True. There's also Desert of the Glorified, the Fervent, the Indomitable. Um, you, you see the theme here, uh, the mindful, the, these are all sort of the aftermath of the, of the gods and, and what's been left over. They're really simple cards though. They're deserts, they're land deserts, they're common. They tap for their color. So the desert of the true taps for white. And then, you know, there's one for each color. Uh, they enter the battlefield tapped. So that's a significant cost. And then they have cycling for one in a white or one in a black or, you know, whichever color uh, that corresponds to them. So again, Desert of the True is the white version of this. So cycling for one in a white, taps for white, and enters the battlefield tapped. Um, look, the, these are probably the premium way to get the whole desert thing going, right? Because you can cycle them. They still have, you, you'll still have deserts working. You can just play them. They tap for mana. And yes, they do enter the battlefield tapped, which is a real cost, but it's not, you know, prohibitive. You can still play them. I would always play like, the first two of these. And then once you have two, you're, st you're starting to... The first two on-color deserts? On-color. Yeah. yeah. yeah because they cost, they cost on-color to cycle. You can't play them off-color. Um, mm -hmm. Exactly. 
But once you have more than that, you start to actually pay a cost. But most decks can just easily play two end of the battlefield tap lands with just no drawback, essentially, or very minimal drawback. Can't mm-hmm. no drawback. Because cycling is so powerful. When you draw this as your sixth land, you just get to cycle it. It's so powerful to do that. Yeah. And remember, you know, you're meeting the desert requirement whether you cycle it or play it because it'll be in your graveyard or on the battlefield. So, I, I, I just think these cards are good, you know, and, and we talked about it when we went over uh, the cycle of uncommons that we'll go over next. You know, picking a land is a really good way to get ahead in draft because you're just simply playing more of the cards that you chose, uh, you know, versus somebody who didn't. So they're likely to be C pluses. I think so too. I think they're going to be good. Like, and and I think if you have any of the Desert Matters cards, they're they're going to go up. Um, so yeah, take those. They're they're good cards. Uh, the next is a cycle that we covered on the podcast. We'll cover them here again. Um, for posterity, but they're um, all the same type of card. They're a desert, and there's one of each color, just like the others, except for these don't enter the battlefield tap. They actually enter the battlefield untapped, and they can tap for colorless, or they can tap for their color of mana, one for each color. Um, but you also have to pay a life if you do that. So uh, keep that in mind. Very low impact, though, on your mana base generally. The life matters, but it's not critical, and you don't you know, you can use the colorless and a planes or whatever for this first one. It's called Shafet Dunes. It's the white version. And then they all have an activated ability that requires you to pay some mana, tap this thing, and then sacrifice a desert, which can be it or another one, and you'll get an, you'll get a, a, an effect. So, for example, Shafet Dunes is two white white, tap it, and sacrifice a desert. And if you do, creatures you control get plus one plus one until end of turn, and you can only do it anytime you can cast a sorcery. This card, it's this, fine. It's fine. This is, I think, one of the weaker so, ones. Yes, but the opportunity cost is still very low. Because if you draw exactly. this in a planes, you're not taking damage and this enters untapped. And if you take two damage off this, that's probably less impactful than when the times when you can just sack this to get an extra four damage through or five damage through. Exactly. So, and remember, the umbrella under which all of these live is that they are all deserts and therefore meet that requirement for cards in your deck that care about that, which is a big deal. And they uh, combine well with the cycling deserts where if you like had to mm-hmm. play Desert of the True earlier, this could eat it, give your creatures, creatures plus plus one, next turn, sack the Shafet Dunes, and you got two turns of bonuses. So yeah, that's a big deal. I think these cards are all quite good. Even this one that's not super strong, I think it's still pretty good. And if you are playing a Tokens deck or a Go Wide deck, it's it's good. I mean, that's just a it, good card. It basically, they're all C pluses except for the blue one, Ipnu Rivulet, which I wouldn't play because mm-hmm. that's a blue and tap Blue, one, tap, sack a desert, target player, put the top four cards, or here's your library into a graveyard. I don't think a desert mill deck is particularly realistic, though you could try it. This one I'm a little less sure about. Yeah, I think you'd want two Ipnu Rivulets and then as many other deserts as you could get your hands on. And, and, so, and some of the blue commons that that mill, both uh, Compelling yeah. Argument and uh, Seer of Lost Truths or whatever the, <laughs> whatever the, the Seer blue. Seer of the Last Tomorrow, I think it's called, yeah. So – but like Chef, Chefet Dunes, uh, Desert of the Fervent, if near Deadlands, or sorry, Chefet Dunes, if near Deadlands, uh, Ramunapa, Ramunap Ruins, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Hashup Oasis are all like C plus with the Deadlands actually being a B minus. Well, why don't, one. You, why don't you read that one? Because I mean, we, two we, black, yeah. black, tap, sack a desert, put two minus one, minus one counters on target creature and opponent controls. And oh, yeah. Speed. That's the best so, one. Yeah, that, that I think is, is a, actually, I think that's just a B. I, I, I do just, too. It's just a straight removal spell like in and of itself, let alone if you have other deserts. Yeah. With the red and the green ones, dealing two damage to your opponent in for red and giving a creature plus three, plus three for green. At sorcery are, speed. At sorcery speed. These are yeah. both playables. Again, they're they're kind of like Shafet Dunes, the white one. They're all the really low opportunity cost. You should just play them in your deck and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll give you an extra bonus some of the games. Yeah. Um, We've got a couple of uh, three more lands here. Uh, one of them is Crypt of the Eternals. It's uh, why don't you read that one? So it enters the battlefield and you gain a life. So it's mm-hmm. a land at uncommon. You taps for a colorless, or you can pay one and tap it and add blue, black, or red to your mana pool. So it's Grixis. Uh, but you're paying one to do that. So it's kind of it's basically a worse painted dunes for only Grixis colors. But it, it gains you a life when you play it. It is not a desert. Uh, this card looks pretty bad to me. I would yeah. not play it unless I was full Grixis. And even then, I'm not excited about that. So no, it's a real clunky card. That, that Having to pay that extra mana just makes it so much worse. 
So what where would you grade it? I would give it a D. It's a D, right? Uh, next is Dunes of the Dead. This is uh, a like desert. Dead, but dunes. Yes, and it, and it is a desert, this one. It's uncommon. It taps for colorless. It says, when Dunes of the Dead is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. So the first thing that comes to mind, of course, are this cycle of deserts that can sack another desert. You could turn it into a 2-2, but man, that feels like it's asking a lot. Especially given that Dunes of the Dead, really the only other upside is that it is a desert and it meets that requirement because it only taps for colorless mana. It's pretty annoying to have in your deck. Basically, you'd need a couple ways to have this trigger before you would want to play it. And there's not really not that many. Like, how how is this happening exactly? I mean, like I said, just the the other cycle, you know, the one, the chef but at Dunes a, and I, I can't company. think of any other commons or uncommons yeah. besides Right. Yeah, I don't think so. I would probably not play with unless I had two ways to sack it, unless your mana base was somehow just perfect. I just, I, yeah, I, I really don't like Dunes of the Dead. I, I just hate upsetting my mana base. Look, the upside's okay, but like even then, it's not like you just go off. You make a two-two. I mean, that is incidentally good, but I, I think Dunes of the Dead is very bad. Like I just don't anticipate on running it very often, if at all. I would say it's like a D, D minus. Yeah, this looks like a D minus to me. If you want it, um, I think no one else will. And most of the time you also will not want it. Yeah, I think so too. Last card is called Survivor's Encampment. It's a common desert. So this is one we should pay attention to. Uh, it taps for colorless and you can tap it and tap an untapped creature you control to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So we, we've seen this card before. Uh, this was actually, I think, called Survivor's Encampment. <laughs> mm, uh, is, this, is this the one from like an ally set or something? It's, it's one from, yeah, uh, Oath of the Gatewatch. Oh, uh, yeah. I think it was actually literally the same thing, but I can't remember 100%. But uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, this is a desert, so it can't be the exact same card. Ah, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. It is functionally the same outside of being a desert. Uh, I like this card if you care about deserts because Me it, too. It, you know, it combines well with all the desert stuff and we, after playing with this card before, often it'll do what you want it to do. You don't really want to play it in a two-color deck unless you have desert-specific things, but in a three-color deck, it's a good way to splash. I think so, too. I mean, it's a C- or a D plus or something. I mean, this isn't, I don't think, a card you're going to be chasing down, but it, you'll see it on the battlefield occasionally, and it'll probably pull its weight, especially if you're doing the desert thing. I mean, that that's the big question mark for all of these. Uh, I think you could just run the original cycle, the cycling ones, um, you know, as long as you're on color anyway, but all the other ones are like really questioning, Hey, you know, are you, you know, like this dunes of the dead and this one, um, you know, all the ones that say desert that don't allow you to, uh, do the whole cycle thing or, or I think really dependent on, you know, are you getting paid off for this? Cause like if you put dunes of the dead in your deck, you are taking a pretty big hit on your mana. So you really need to be able to be paid off and survivors encampment is a bit of a clunky land, uh, in and of itself. So I think that, you know, you, you do want to make sure you're getting paid, uh, by, you know, having cards that care. Yeah. About don't just that. put this in your deck, but if you have like two things that care about deserts and enough low drop creatures, then yeah, by all means. Yeah. Then run it out there. Um, important to note here as well is that you can tap the untapped creature, even if it has summoning sickness, right. which is, uh, something that might not seem intuitive, but is the case. All right. That's going to do it. That's the last card here for our, uh, hour of devastation, common and uncommon set review. Good stuff. Um, I'm really curious to see if the format changes in tone and feel. Uh, from what I've seen, I anticipate it probably won't that much. It seems quite aggressive still. It still seems like blocking's out. Uh, and I don't really see a whole lot that shoved us in a direction that made me think it's going to change. But I'm open to it, and I, I kind of hope it does. I wouldn't mind seeing a little bit of a trend back towards the mid range. I kind of miss playing that style of limited and not have to worry that you're just going to get completely trounced, <laughs> you know, out of a, you know, from a from a really good uh, low curve deck. So we'll see. Um, but uh, this set looks like it's got some interesting stuff going on with the whole deserts thing, and then some of the other uh, tribal and other interactions that we've seen. So we'll have to see. Uh, we will have the rare and mythic rare show for you next week. So don't, uh, so be sure to, uh, tune in for that one because you'll want to get an idea for what cards you're really going to be first picking a lot. Those are the, the cards that you end up doing that on, uh, for next week. Uh, until then, I want to remind you the show is brought to you by channelfireball.com. That is your place to go for hour of devastation and any other magic cards that you need. You can get singles, sealed products, supplies, free content, all of it in one place, channelfireball.com. They will take care of you. They get your stuff shipped out to you quickly. Their customer service is fantastic. 
They'll make sure that you're happy. And uh, you can even get cool limited resources stuff there, sleeves and deck boxes, that kind of stuff on channelfireball.com. If you want to find us on social media, it's easy to do. I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. Come say hi. We're on Twitter. We're all over the place. And uh, if you want to find where we're at, I, I put a list of links right on the front page of lrcast.com. That's kind of the homepage for the website. It's all there. It just makes it the easiest for you to be able to find all the things we do. We have a YouTube channel. We have a Facebook page. Uh, we have a subreddit, a very active, awesome subreddit full of people that are insightful, that can help you out and and sort of reinforce a lot of the things that we talk about here on the show and uh, our streams and just blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on. And it's all right there on the front page of lrcast.com. Thank you so much for taking the time to hang out. We do appreciate it. And we will see you next week. So we're in the middle of a Hall of Fame voting season right now. And uh, I'm not going to go on about the Hall of Fame, but I do have a funny story about it from uh, years past. Uh, first of all, have you have you decided on your vote yet? I did. In fact, I sent it in today. Who are you voting for? Josh Utterleyton. That's a solid ballot. Mm -hmm. uh, Raptor's great. He's He's been on the show before, uh, which is, I think, a qualification for being in the Hall of Fame. But... <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. And it, it really, his resume just jumped out as the one that was just, you know, a no-brainer. And everybody else... I could really pick apart. So I said, you know what? I, I want people that are no brainers. I want, I, I want it to be like that guy deserves in, you know? And so, uh, and he was the one for me. I mostly voted for people with no brains, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I voted for Josh Hutter, Layton, Martin Yuza and, uh, Mark Herberholtz. But the part I find funny about hall of fame season is a people generally just vote for whoever they want to, and then make up criteria afterwards as to what they value. <laughs> Which is fine because mm -hmm. it, it is subjective. And B, there have been some really strange shenanigans going on, just like buffoonery. And, and here's a good example. Uh, William Jensen, in, who is in the Hall of Fame, he got inducted in 2013, the greatest Hall of Fame class of all time. Uh, but It really was a great one. <laughs> well, <laughs> For those who don't know, it was Luis, Ben, Stark, and, and Huey. Which I, I still think is the best uh, team draft Hall of Fame class, actually. Has to be. be has specific. to be. Uh, but Huey and Ben can carry me for sure. Uh, I, I can sit in the middle and help them play their games. <laughs> They're both much better drafter than me. But uh, Ben once claimed that he he wishes he could draft all my decks, and then uh, then I could play and then have them. you play the games. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, in 2012, Huey missed by one vote, and the reason he did, Brad Nelson was like, "I've been told I should vote for Huey." Which, first of all, you should probably think about who you're voting for and know who they are. And second of all, he gets his ballot and is like, "Huey." Wait, who's Huey? He's like, oh, Eugene Harvey, I guess. And so he votes for Eugene Harvey. Oh, my God. Not William Jensen. Oh he doesn't even know God. Huey's real name. And then Huey misses by one vote. Oh, my God. I did not know that. That is ridiculous. That it is It actually absurd. is just it, – it, make, like, it makes me wish Brad had just not voted for Huey at all. Like I wish Huey had gotten in the Hall of Fame or a year earlier because I think he deserved it. I voted for him you know, every year until he made it. But – you should not be voting for someone who you don't even know their name. And the fact that he voted for the wrong person because it sounded like that he is was completely like absurd. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. Man, I wish I had a vote in 2012. I would have. I probably <laughs> wouldn't have voted for him. It took me a while to get to know Huey, you know, yeah. because he he was in an era significantly before when I was around at all. And I had heard of him, but only in passing. I never met him or seen him play. And, you know, I, I got to give him a lot of credit because he came back and started playing a lot and really made himself more visible. And, and I got a chance to meet him, you know, and actually like interact with him a little bit, see what kind of a character, you know, what kind of character he had. And then also watch him just smash as he, you know, ramped his way back up over the next, uh, you know, year or two. And I was commentating a lot of the, the GPs and he top edited another PT and he, he certainly earned my vote, uh, among other things, uh, my friendship as well. But, you know, the, the truth is that you followed up with friendship because that sounded a little inappropriate until then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, quickly fill in the blanks there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, that's insane. I can't believe that he missed because of that. I'm glad he made it in now. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, look, I, I think the hall of fame is important. I take it very seriously. I think about it a lot. Um, when it comes time to vote. But I also think there's a lot of ludicrous stuff that goes on in the Hall of Fame, and that was just one of them. It's just like, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, well, there we are. <laughs> <laughs>